I'll share the screen. And I just wanted to, and, and now the, this uh, presentation is uh, online in the, in the website. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight that uh, a perspective that I wrote with uh, Megan Driscoll, a friend is uh, out on data science in cell imaging. I think it will be interesting for, for, for some of you at least uh, to read it. It is aimed to, it's, it's published in a journal of cell biology. So it's aimed to biologists. I think it's interesting to see how I'm trying to explain modularity and abstraction and other things that are trivial for us uh, to the biological audience. And uh, I think that you'll find it interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain exactly what are the, what is the scope of the field. And I'm also mentioning this course. Uh, I, when I say I, I mean we. Uh, so I, I it, so it's not open access, but I, I share the, in, in the Moodle, I share the direct the copy, personal copy. So you can, you can read it if you'd like. Uh, We'll, we'll continue working on uh, deep learning in microscopy and I'm going to skip uh, the first slide that we went last time. And I'm going to just remind you uh, about the content aware image restoration, which was the topic that uh, we discussed last time. And the idea was that you cannot have it all. If we want to image fast, uh, we're going to get uh, smaller fields of views and, and more laser power on our cells, which is going to cause damage and, uh, and uh, a lower uh, signal to noise ratio. So each time when we, when we get something, we lose something else. So it's the, trade, the basic trade off of imaging. And the question is, can we uh, uh, use structure within our data to compensate for that a little bit? <clears throat> so CARE was one of the first uh, papers that actually uh, did something very, 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 uh, uh, Simple methodology, methodology, but uh, impressive in terms of the application, and they did it very uh, thoroughly. So I think they did a very good job in, in, in attacking that from, from different perspective and, and showing the whole uh, the whole uh, possibilities of, of, of what you can do. And uh, there, and the other works that I'm going to present today uh, were followed by many other uh, papers, which basically did the same idea on different uh, domains, different applications, and uh, you will get part of what you'll be able to, to present in class are, are these papers. Some of them are very new, that come, just came out uh, in the last few months or even weeks. Okay, so I, I remind you what was the idea of uh, content aware image restoration. Uh, here you see on the bottom, you can see my marker, my mouse? Okay, so on the bottom here, you see a, 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 a low, resolution image, a bad image. On the top, you can see a, a, a good image, right? Image with a lot of laser power or a lot, a lot of exposure time. Um, and and what, what, what they did basically, they take uh, the high resolution image, the better image, artificially reduce its quality. So this is what you see here in the bottom. And now train a network to map the low quality to the high quality images. And then they, they train a model and they can use this model to get this uh, input low uh, quality images and map them into high quality images. Okay. So this is uh, basically the idea. Uh, if you have questions, please ask because this is, if you don't understand that, then it's a problem. The rest, so this is the idea. And the machinery is a unit. Uh, we talked about it. It's a, it's a, it's a version of an autoencoder with its uh, leaping uh, edges between the between the different layers, uh, which provide information across scale. Okay, so we showed a lot of results. I maybe I'll show one video, which is pretty impressive. I think maybe I'll share my screen also. I'll I'll, I'll use it in full mode. So what you see here is a planaria and the image did with a high laser power and low laser power. And this is high laser power. So you see the image is very good, but the, but the animal is tweaking, right? It's suffering, right? Let's, let's look at that again. The animal is suffering. I mean, you don't get the natural behavior of the, of the cell within it. You can see all this uh, twitching. And with low uh, resolution, with low exposure, sorry, the image quality is just poor, but you don't see this uh, twitching. 
So now if you apply this network, this care network, you go from low resolution to high resolution and fantastic, right? And it's great. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, why did you get rid of the twitching because of the algorithm? No, 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 no. The twitching is, is the real thing within the animal. So if you, I mean, it's actually a very nice uh, demonstration why it is so important. So they, 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 they lasered their, their cells in order to so in the, their, the animal here, right? So they can see it very nicely. Right, let's let's look at it again. They they put 60 times more laser power than, than the low resolution image. And then this laser, what it did, it, it, it caused this uh, twi twitching, which is basically an animal that is suffering. The cells are are not happy, right? And 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 the muscles are you know that, that it just this is you know this is an artifact of causing damage to the cells. Because of the energy of the laser, that's the idea. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. You are blasting your cells. I mean, they are yeah, they're really having a hard time. And if you reduce the laser power, this is sixty times less, right? Sixty, sixty, yeah, sixty, six times less, less energy, less laser power. You see that uh, there is not much. The, the artifacts are, are are not seen anymore, but the quality is bad. So it's really hard to segment the cells and track them. And understand what happens in the cellular level. So by mapping these low to high quality images, they can achieve now the ability to to actually uh, uh, post process the the images, high quality images without causing damage to the cells. Okay. Thank you. You're free. Thank you, Alina. I'm, I'm very happy that you're asking these questions because uh, these are. Uh, very important. Uh, okay, I think we stopped somewhere here. Let me see, I wrote it down somewhere. And uh, I think I showed you that, but I'm going to show you again. And, and the idea is not just to show beautiful images, right? But to actually uh, perform downstream analysis. So in this type of systems, uh, when you want to follow the morphogenesis of uh, the development of an animal, for example, you want to image it for a lot of time and see each individual cell, what it does at what time and how it interacts with other cells, et cetera. You need to first image for a long time. So you need to use very low laser power so the cells will uh, hold up. And second, what you need is the ability to segment them and track them accurately so you can have this information for the post-processing. So what you see here is the ability to to, to, to improve the, 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 the downstream analysis, in this case, the ability to segment and track the cells accurately. So on the left here, you see, you see uh, the input image and you can see that the results are, the, and this is the segmentation results. In black here, you see mistakes, okay? So you see that the, the mistakes uh, go, with time it goes, and, and with, with time the, the, the tracking, which is following the cell over time, the, the, the mistakes are propagating and accumulating. So you get more and more, we get more and more errors here, right? Uh, while when we do the same thing on the net, the same analysis on the, the output of the network, we get results that, that stay are about the same. Okay, and, and this is very similar to what we get from the ground truth. So, so th this is the, the ratio between the accuracy of the ground truth and the and the uh, the output of the segmentation, the ground the segment a segmentation algorithm performed on the ground truth versus uh, on, on in blue here is the network output, and in green here it's the it's the input data. So you can see that uh, you lose here a lot of uh, accuracy, while in the blue you get the uh, high accuracy. Okay, I think I showed you last time, probably you don't remember. The second, uh, the second uh, thing was looking at the, uh, looking at the, uh, so the, one of the problems here was that we needed pairs of, uh, of, of images. So we needed to take a high a quality image, high quality image and a low quality image that match in order to do this mapping. This requires a lot of work 
and it's not trivial at all to do it, right? You need the samples not that they don't move, and it requires the switch. It's it's a lot of work. We don't want that. And here here uh, the authors did something nice about uh, avoiding the need of uh, annotated data. So as an example here, they took uh, 3D images, and the third dimension, the Z dimension, is not as good as the X and Y. This is just an inherent property of most uh, microscopes that allow 3D imaging. It's like MRI or, or, right, or, or CT images. You have these slices in, in, the, in the third dimension. And what they did here, they took images in the second dimension, which has better resolution. They artificially degrade, degraded them. So they produced from high resolution two-dimensional images, low resolution images that resemble what happened in 3D. And then they trained the network to learn this mapping from low, the low three-dimensional resolution to the high two-dimensional resolution. Last time, I remember that I got a question about uh, whether there is different behavior in 2D versus 3D. And in general, we're not expecting something like that. We're expecting the patterns to be the same in, 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 the, in the patterning of the objects that we see here. So the really loss of information is just because of the microscopy. And so they simulated the degradation that happens in the microscope by the reduced resolution. And then uh, using another training, another network, but this time without any annotated tra match training data, they showed that they can uh, map low resolution images to a uh, high resolution images. So you can see this is the input in th three dimension. And this is the, what, this is the output of the network. Where again, you can see here, it's much you can see much nicer the individual, in this case, it's nuclei of the cells, right? Which will allow later post-processing, which will allow later to identify more accurately each of the cells, okay? So this is called, the third dimension is called the axial resolution, right? And now you can see that uh, how they improve the axial resolution of the, the acquired volumes of the 3D images that they acquire. So this is how the input looks. And this is uh, the output of, uh, of the network. And you can see it's very nicely. These are different fluorescent channels that you can see here. And these are the nuclei. This is some uh, membrane markers. And you can see, I mean, here, for example, in the membrane markers, you can see that from the network, you can get something that is really, you can now identify really accurately single cells with your eye and computationally, while in the top image, it's really hard to do this, especially with a computer. And if we want to quantify that, uh, uh, we can do it here. So these are two measures of uh, image uh, quality. And what you see here, is the artificial subsample factor. So how bad we, we, we reduce the, the, uh, the resolution of our image in the third dimension. And here you can see, here higher is better. Higher is close to the ground truth. You can see that, uh, uh, sorry, higher is, uh, is worse, right? So if we increase the subsampling factor, we get a, a, a lower resolution and we get worse images but these images are always better uh, with the network and with the SSIM, which is a, a, another measure for image similarity, but it, it uses the, but, but the, a higher is better, you see the other, the, the, the opposite trend. And here are uh, results okay. on the, yeah. Can you go back? What are the two measures, NRMSE and the SIIM? These are measures for uh, image similarity. Okay. So you compare before and after? You compare, so the x-axis here is the subsampling factor, which means that the one is, is the, the raw image, right? Is the, the two-dimensional, the, 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 the 2D quality, right? The high quality. And then the subsampling factor means that now you degrade the image artificially with a factor of two, with four, six, et cetera, okay? So you get worse and worse images. And the blue line, the blue trend shows how bad we become. So this is a, a distance matrix from the, from the ground truth image, right? How bad we, 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 we go when we reduce the resolution of the image. 
And you can say that, uh, that it's always better when we use the network compared to the input itself. And the same is the SS, SSIM, which is a different measure of image similarity. Uh, and you see the opposite trend. We are going to talk a little bit about image similarities maybe in next class, but yeah. What is a good image similarity measure? Okay, Alina. I, I, I'm afraid I, I didn't understand uh, because I didn't understand what, what is image similarity. What, what do you compare? So I understand the X axis when you go down in the resolution. And now what do you measure? You have the, you, ha you always have your ground truth image, right? You always have your ground truth image as reference. So because everything you start with a 2D image with high resolution. So this is your starting point. And now you can compare the similarity between what okay, you get so you're from comparing aggregate. comparing everything to the one, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And the same, the same type of analysis, uh, which looks at the, at the, at the post-processing. Eventually, we don't want just pretty pictures. We want to quantify them. So here uh, you can look at the segmentation in three dimensions. And uh, you can see that here you have a big cubic interpolation, which is basically, is trying to improve the, the quality of the image uh, computationally with a, with, with, with a, with a simple uh, analytical uh, 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 improvement. And here is the output of the network. And you can see that the post-processing using the same segmentation algorithm, we get much uh, nicer results uh, in the, in, with the network outcome. And the black here are, 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 are matches that are lost compared to the ground truth. And this is, uh, so we go from, from uh, qualitative to quantitative, right? We start with images, then we go to post-processing, but we still look at the, just at, uh, at some examples and eventually we can go and look at it uh, systematically. So here we compare the, um, here basically the idea is to check the ability to track cells over time. Tracking cells is also well, the rate limiting factor is the ability to, 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 to match pairs of, uh, of, of the same, you have time, right? You have uh, something that goes over time and you want to match a cell to itself in the, in the consecutive time points. So this is uh, over time you, when you just accumulate mistakes. If you mistake, you, you get more and more mistakes. And, uh, and what you see here is uh, the, the mistakes of uh, just using the big cubic interpolation and, and doing the post-processing of segmentation and tracking, which you can see here in green. And, uh, ah, sorry, this is not over time. This is over the threshold of defining what is a, what is a cell and what is not a cell. Uh, so when you, when, when you have a very strict threshold, basically you have only, you, but you, you get, you don't get a lot of uh, mistakes, but you lose a lot of cells, right? You track only a, a small subset of this, of your cells. If you are looking at the low uh, threshold, you have a lot of cells, but then you have a lot of mistakes and, and, and you do also mistakes in, in, in this matching in, in tracking. Okay. So basically the idea is to show that the blue is, is much below the, the green, which, which shows the potential of just improving the images artificially and how it can improve the, what we are really interested in, which is something that relates to tracking the cells. Okay, so this, we had the two, two demonstrations uh, by now. We had a matched images, a high quality, low quality. We had, high quality and artificially producing low quality in the Z. And now we're going to, to see the magic of uh, just using simulated data. So now we're going to look at training data that is not even coming from an experiment, train a model and then test it on experimental data, okay? So of course, I mean, what they picked are, are simple structures that we, we know already how to simulate. I mean, the field know already how to simulate these structures. But still, it's, I think it's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so they, they synthetically generate training data and they have these simulators in this group. They have a point spread function simulator and they add camera noise and background autofluorescence. So they generate 
fake images which are uh, which are built out of physical properties of the real optical system and once they do that so that they can they can uh, they can look at ground truth images and reduce their uh, their um, their uh, the, the images right that are generated and 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 then see how they can improve the, the images again so uh, what you can see here on the left are microtubules which are these uh, filamentous uh, structure, which will be the, 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 the skeleton of the cell. And uh, they're kind of the, and, 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 uh, and these are this kind of, they create these kind of networks that you see here, networks in space, not the, not Twitter networks, right? But network, uh, spatial network. And uh, on the bottom here, you can see, uh, so this is simulated on the top and on the bottom it's simulated plus adding all the art, all the, the, the artifacts that come from imaging. So point spread function, adding noise, etc. And this is, a, the, this is another object which is more like functa based and they do the same thing can they, uh, here, can they degrade the, the quality of the image. And now they train a model to map from a, a bad quality image to a good quality image to a higher quality image. This is the network. And now they can take they can take synthetic images and see how they can uh, generate high quality synthetic images, and they can take experimental data and and look how it how it performs there. So on the left here you see wild field images, which are you see they are not very not very high quality images, right? And on the right here you can see the network reconstruction. So the network is trying to reconstruct the ground truth, right? How really these objects look when you take out all the, all the artificial components that happen between, between the, the truth thing to what we get after all the imaging artifacts. Right, so this is a real experimental image and this is the reconstruction after uh, we, after the, 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 and, and this mapping is performed with a network that have never seen any experimental data whatsoever, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. I have a question. Uh, you can see all of this uh, uh, image and videos uh, that are really, really looks nicer after the uh, reconstruction of the networks, but do we have any, uh, uh, any metrics uh, metric that support uh, that the reconstructed network is better for the analysis? Uh, okay, I, I thought that you were going to a different direction, but in principle, this type of analysis, you mean this type of, uh, of, uh, of analysis? I mean, this type of analysis, right? I mean, here, here you see that, uh, that the, the post-processing after you after you have beautiful images, you want to track to segment and track cells, right? So you can measure yeah. the the number of mistakes in segmenting correctly cells and the number of mistakes in the accumulated mistakes in tracking, and this would be the mm -hmm. measurement. This is what you ask. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So one of the pay, I'm going to talk about it a little bit and a little bit in a different context, not in image restoration, but in Hopefully I'll get to it to, toward the end of the lesson today. Uh, I'm going to take about what are the what are the right metrics to show success, right? Or to 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 to, to say if, if you are doing something good or, or not good, right? Uh, I, I'm going to talk about it in a, in a little bit different context. You are going one paper uh, that I'm going to one paper that I'm suggesting for for students paper is is exactly about that about selecting practical measures. So. The right measure is not the image similarity necessarily, but what you want to eventually measure in terms of functionality of the system. Right, Anatoly? And this is, I'm very happy right. saying that because this is a thinking of a, of a data scientist. You, you usually, a lot, you know, a, a lot of time, uh, 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 people who use these tools or they're, they're not thinking about these things, at least not, not at the beginning. And also I think, I think the field is now mature enough to think about these things, but at the beginning it was, People kind of ignored it or 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 didn't uh, you know didn't put a lot of attention into that. There is one paper that uh, deals with that uh, almost directly, 
Uh, and uh, actually one project in my, my lab is also dealing with what are the right ways to measure for specific functionality. I, I'll talk about it, not this week for sure, maybe next week. So can we measure, um, can we measure uh, this directly after the reconstruction or we should, uh, or uh, there is a metric for each uh, uh, purpose of the data? Okay, yeah, so, so I mean, if you, if you really want to see if it's, I mean, eventually for each, for each data acquisition, we have, a, we have a problem that we want to solve, right? We want to ask a, a specific question. Then you are, this is exactly what you are alluding to, that yes, we need to define the right measurement per the application, per the question that we want to ask. Okay. This, is very, this is very important. So this is why looking at the measurements for general image similarity is, you know, it's easy and it's, the, we are just starting. I mean, the field is just it's, it's just start, starting, so it's fine, right? I don't have. Uh, I think that it's fine. I mean, you can do that, and it's uh, perfect. But but if you really want, it, it, when we mature, when we mature as a field, we need to get to get more more specific uh, measurements for success. And Great, then, thanks. of course, uh, Anatoly, we can compare different algorithms, and and once we have measures for a specific measure for success. All the computer scientists can come in and start to try this network and that network and try all, all the tri tricks to improve that, right? Yeah. And um, Asaf, what is special about the synthetic data in the last, uh, in the previous slide? I mean, all the data that we trained the network before was also a kind of synthetic because we took a good image, we destroyed it with the autoencoder, right? Uh, uh, sorry, we destroyed it somehow, and then did taught the the, the uh, and then trained the the model uh, with the autoencoder. So, what is different with this specific uh, with those examples in the previous slide? Okay, so so I'll, I'll repeat that, and then please tell me if 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 you don't understand, please tell me. Okay, so so probably I, I just didn't explain it well enough or clear enough. So uh, the initial data. What we show this uh, tweaking, twitching, and then stopping twitching, right? It's the data that was uh, used in order to train the model to to improve the these images was based not on a, on computer computerized degradation of an image, but actually taking one image with a lot of laser power and a second image of the same object with low laser power, right? So and you then, would not use. And then someone did a comparison. I mean. I mean, and, and then we train the network to map, to map, we, we give the network a low and we, we try to map it to a high, okay? So this was one. The second was, it, it, we used simulations. They used simulations for that. It's not simulations. They used the artificial degradation of the image, but they still took images, training images in, in 2D and degraded them artificially to, to resemble what happens in 3D, okay? Mm -hmm. And then they map again the low quality 3D image to a high quality that was that is the true image from the 2D. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the third case here is no experimental data whatsoever. Now, of course, you have an assumption, you know the structures that you are interested in, and microtubules are are, are important structures that people are know a lot about and simulate them and etc. So there is a lot of knowledge on how they look and how they behave and and there is a lot of knowledge on how the on how the microscope works, right? On what 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 happens between uh, the image acquisition, you know, between taking an image and actually getting an image, right? So uh, and, and and there's also these granular structures, these uh, puncta yeah, circular yeah. structures. Also, I mean, people know how to simulate them, know how to simulate the microscope, so we can generate realistic data. But it's still pretty impressive that now now you can take this and apply it to real images and still get this uh, amazing improvement. And now, of course, we don't know what is the ground truth here because we don't, you know, we don't have it. And, but, you know, but it's- I okay, think so, so, the, so the images on the top are basically not real. That's, that's the idea. On the top of the previous slide, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Here, I, here the, the images on not, the not, right not side. Not this one, not this one, the one before, the, the, the slide before. Uh, yeah, no, those it, those at the top are, are, are not real images. These are, these are computer generated. These yeah, are yeah. okay. Images. But these oh, are this. these are experimental image on the left, and on mm -hmm. the right these are uh, yeah. reconstructed the images, right? Which we don't know if they are 
it looks real, right? I mean, it looks, well, you don't know, but I, I can tell you that it looks pretty real. And, and, and this is another problem that we are talk, can, can talk about whether if it looks real, is it, is it real? Or is, uh, maybe the network is imagining some stuff, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. Okay. Anyway, we are, we are still looking at, uh, at, uh, at quality, right? So looking at the performance, so you can look at the top here, you can see the input images, which are pretty crappy and the network reconstruction. And now you can start to see these nice structures, right? Of the, which look like microtubules. So you can see this, you know, this uh, filamentous uh, uh, fibers and this, uh, and this uh, puncta object. And now uh, a, a very, you know, a very a kind of, uh, uh, I, I would call it completely, uh, you know, partly quantitative. I mean, it is quantitative, but it, uh, it's cherry picking the, the, the images. You can see here, a, a you can see here this line, line uh, profile. And, and, and basically what they did here is they measure the intensity along this line profile. And when you look here at this line profile, you can see two is, uh, when, when you look at it, you can see every time that you pass an edge here, so you go from uh, dark to, from black to green, you're going to see an, an increase here, right? And this is what you can see here. I mean, you can see here that there is an increase and you can see that in the, if you take the input image, you see something that is more blurred. You cannot really see the clear separation between the background and the, and the, the object. If you take a standard convolution, the convolution I told you about it last week is a process where you, when you analytically try to improve your image, you know the properties of the microscope and you try to reverse engineer what would be the true image uh, by knowing the properties. So it's a, it's, it's a, a model based. So it's based on what you know about the image acquisition and the network, which is the, the, the most, uh, uh, how do you call it? The most, um, uh, had, uh, sharp. sharp. Yeah, the most, there is a better word, but anyway, the most sharp transition from background to non background. Okay. Okay, so here is an. Uh, okay. an Can you go, sorry for uh, asking again, what are the graphs showing? The okay. graphs show the x axis is this, uh, pro these profile lines. Okay, so it got the intensities from, I don't know if it comes from the bottom or from the top, but let's say uh, top, uh, top uh, left to bottom right, okay? The blue is the ground truth. So for example, you can see here, I mean, in, in you can see here in, uh, in uh, one, for example, the ground truth, you can see that it goes up, it goes from black to green. And then it goes to kind of a, kind of something intermediate between the green and the black. This is the blue pattern that you see here in the bottom. While when we look at the reconstructed image, which is the uh, orange uh, uh, line profile below, you can see a very clear, you can see this is a small hill and each hill is a filament. So you can see the transition from background to non-background, which is basically transitioning here over, over the filaments here, okay? So, so basically the algorithm of uh, the care is much better than the convolution. Right, uh, you know, in this system and uh, this SDS setting, et cetera. And the idea is that you, and what is the advantage of, of, the, of uh, the, the, the machine learning model? Uh, that it is based on the true data, right? So it uses, it's data-driven. It's not model-driven, it's data-driven. So the convolution says, okay, I know the physical parameters of the system and I'm going to, to, you know, to try to reverse them. And I'll do my best, you know, I'll do this, uh, I'll do this transformation and, and we'll get, you know, we'll try to improve the image. And the data-driven say, I don't know nothing about the system. I don't know how these images are generated, but I do, these networks are really powerful a tools at, at, at mapping, right? At finding relation. So it's actually mining the data and finds the relations within the data to reconstruct it uh, accurately. It, it's actually surprising because the deconvolution seems to be more accurate per a specific, uh, let's say, a microscope or uh, environment. 
Ah, one second, the deconvolution is better than the input. You can see that. It's right better the than input. the input, but it's much uh, less than the network. Yeah, but that's all the whole point of this thing. I mean, if it wouldn't be better, then we just stay with the deconvolution and this paper wouldn't be published and cited the uh, hundreds of times, right? Right. <laughs> this is exactly for me, for me it's new. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I agree, it's pretty amazing. That, but but it, but but the intuition is, uh, you know, once you see that, maybe for me it's already, you know, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, two and a half years that uh, the field even more actually three years that the field knows that these things are possible, uh, and uh, so for me it's already trivial. But yeah, I mean, it's surprising because by intuition you would think that. Uh knowing the specific properties of the specific microscope or whatever you you use for your image uh, and using this information should be better than not knowing that so, so i'm not sure but and let's let's take it into a little different world of uh, machine learning okay you can say the same thing if i want to do a face recognition okay then would it be better now to uh, you know, to look for a nose, right? I have a big one and uh, look for two eyes and then look at the geometric uh, structures between them and do a model driven approach, right? Try to extract features based on, on the domain knowledge that you know, or just throw it into a network and, and let the network learn everything by itself. And, and, and you know, this has revol revolutionized the uh, computer vision because the network does a better job at extracting features that are that, that that have a specific task for a specific task for a specific purpose. So now you're not going to see uh, face detectors that are that are using the approach of engineering features because the networks do it better. Okay, thanks. And so it's less surprising when you come from this perspective when the whole fields of uh, of the computer vision and natural language processing these are the main to uh, features that have changed completely and you know all, all the benchmark have, were broken and changed thanks to thanks to a uh, deep neural network and, and and a lot of computational power of course okay let's take a, let's let's look at this movie and what you what you can see here uh, SFF, SRFF is a super resolution uh, uh, technique. It's a uh, technique to, to enable super resolution. And, uh, and here they can show that they compare care with the super resolution Russell fluctuation technique. So they take a very low quality image on the one hand and they, they, they do the, the S, uh, SRFF, SRRF, sorry. Uh, um, uh, uh, methodology to get a high resolution uh, image and they compare it to the network and they can show that uh, they can image 20 fold faster and get better results, right? And it says, if, if, yeah, 20 folds faster and, and get better results than what you'd get if you were 20 fold slower. So you can image yourself much faster and get better quality data, right? Which is exactly the bottleneck that we said we're trying to they were trying to resolve. So I think it's pretty impressive uh, demonstration. But the next question is, okay, um, we showed that it worked, but what happens if we train the data on one uh, cell type, for example, or animal or whatever, and then we move to a different, a different system? Can we generalize that? And the answer, I mean, of course, when you train on one system, you are going to get the best results on that system, the systems that you were trained, that you trained your data on, that you trained your models on. But uh, it still works pretty nicely also uh, on other models, which shows that it's, you know, that it's uh, a generalized technology. So here you see uh, uh, each, you have your three columns, right? Each one is trained on a different uh, system. The orange is planaria, the green is, uh, is uh, I don't know even what it is exactly, tree volume, and the third is uh, a fly wing, right? Data, so it's, it's completely different data sets. And now they try to apply them 
the network on the different uh, data sets and they see the results. So for example, if we look at the planaria, we see a crappy image and really nice reconstruction. And when we move the planaria, we move to the planaria on the system that was on the model that was trained on another system, it doesn't look as nice, but it still looks pretty nice. So this is an important aspect of generalization. When we train our data on one system, would it generalize to something else? And in microscopy, it's a big deal because, uh, because the data is generated in so many different ways. I mean, you have different systems, you have different, uh, even your cells in different days, they can feel a little bit differently. The microscopes are different, everything is different. There is so much variability within the system, which make it very challenging. So if you can show that your system can generalize across uh, imaging conditions or, or models, it's, it's very powerful. Okay, and the, and the third point that is very important is what they call in their paper the hallucination effect. And this is important because we get nicer images, but maybe we get images that do not resemble the reality, right? How do we know that we generate something that is, uh, that is real? So, okay, this again, this is the first paper. It's, uh, and, and still I think there is a lot to do about the, to, 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 to measure that. But, and I think, but I think people are becoming to be more and more aware and, and being careful about that, what you can say, what you cannot say using these approaches. Uh, but first let's look at some examples. So this is the input, this is the ground truth, and this is the network. And you can see here that the network missed a cell, right? You can see that, right? A cell a nuclei that was detected in the in the ground, a cell that is that is in the, in the ground truth was missed by the network. Uh, sometimes you get the opposite. So, in a, for example, here you can get here. A, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, here you get one big cell, right? This is a membrane marker. So you get this uh, this uh, one cell that the elongated cell from bottom to top. And when you look to the left here, the network uh, thought that these are two cells, right? You can see the line here coming in between. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one thing. And so you can get both mistakes. You can miss things that are real and are missing in the reconstructed image, or you can hallucinate some things that are not really there. And we need to be very, first, we need to be aware of that. And second, uh, we need to be careful about that. And I, I'll, I'll say what exactly. I mean, if we are doing uh, cell tracking or something like that, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, this co causes us to miss a cell or to add a cell and we, we get more mistakes, that's fine. We are going to have mistakes anyway, anyway that we're going to, to need to deal with. We just need to quantify that and to see that it's not too much. But there are other applications of this mapping, which, I hope that I'll get to today, uh, which are, uh, you cannot rely on the reconstruction. You, you need to be super careful about any, any biological insight or biological uh, conclusions that you get from these reconstructed images. Uh, you can see other type of error, reconstruction, uh, background errors, and... Uh, the, the question and, uh, is what, what, what will happen if you take the same area and uh, just with a bit different uh, scope of the image and try to give it again to the model. If you will get the same, you will probably not get the same mistake again. So maybe you can use a kind of um, composition between a few images of the restored, a few restored images. So, so I, I, let me see if I got you right. I mean, looking at, I mean, the, the, the network gets a, a, an image of, of a given size, right? So you, you can give only the same the same region to the to the net right to the network. I mean, tra and training data is based on patches that you take from you know for many images, a lot of images. So this will not help. But if th this is what you meant, or something else? I meant take if, for example, you want to look at some specific region out of uh, this uh, image, you you can you can crop a few images out of it. And, uh, and and run it a few times into the model with different perspectives, and maybe okay. you will get different errors and and 
it's just oh just... i see so you mean so you mean uh, what you mean is if we want to look here then we can take this image and then we can take yes, this something image like, yeah, something like that this yes image, something like that okay yeah so actually it's a good uh, it's a good uh, it's a great question uh, you know what is uh, what is a good question a good question is a question that i know how to answer okay. you, know, you know what is a great question you don't know <laughs> that I have a slide for it, right? So okay. <laughs> tell me if I'm going to tell you this joke the second time and tell me that, uh, yeah, that because of my, my, yeah, tell me that I told you already. So it's a great question, but before I, before we're going, before I'm going, I'm going to keep the suspension a little bit, I'm going to show you a nice demonstration from a, from a nice review on deep learning in microscopy. I really recommend reading it. And we show hallucination effects, right? Uh, so this paper, this uh, this came later, but the person who wrote that was also involved in the in the paper that I'm in the care paper that we are going through now. And you can see, you can see very nicely. I mean, you can get like uh, you, you get these degraded images, or image on the top here, right? This is what you see here. So this is the input. And when uh, when a model was trained based on, based on this uh, alphabet, you get this reconstruction, right? Which is which is nice. When you uh, when you train your data your model on a data set that uh, doesn't include A and E, then the E and the A's. Where do we have your A? Maybe we don't. I don't know. Ah, here. They become something else, right? So now we are hallucinating different letters within the alphabet because we haven't seen them. And if we go to completely different languages with complete, completely different alphabet, look what we get here. Something kind of in between uh, whatever, Chinese and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in English, right? So we need to make sure that if we train our data on something that our, our, our images on something that's complete, completely out of uh, out of the domain or very different and now we look at these images and we try to make conclusions out of them we're going to get conclusions that are completely wrong right this is the this is the message of this slide okay. so yeah. are we supposed to generate uh, training data each time i guess there are uh, tools that uh, don't uh, expect us to do that right Okay, so we are talking about generalization. Now you're asking about generalization. I talked about it a little bit here, right? I mean, here you see that a model that was trained on one data set can be applied on another data set. I'm going to talk a lot about it a little bit more. I just want to, to raise your attention to this issue, right? I mean, it's something that we need to be aware of. We cannot just trust the, the, the imaginary images, right? right? The images that are constructed, the fake images, and trust them as true. When you see Obama say something, right? There are the, 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 the deep fake images of Obama saying something, right? Which he never said, you know, we need to be careful not to trust them, right? So anyway, and uh, Gil, I'm going back now to your excellent uh, question. So the authors of this paper, and, and, and let's finish this and then we'll go to a break, okay? I'm, I'm just, I want to finish the paper and then we can, it will be a better time to stop. Um, and, and what you can see here is uh, basically uh, what they did is something uh, similar to what you proposed, Gil. They, uh, they predicted the distribution, a pixel-wise distribution of each pixel, and then they looked at the uncertainty. So they calculated pixel-wise probability distribution and then calculated the uncertainty from that. And, and then they sampled from these distributions. And what you can see here, this is the mean. Okay, let's stop. This is the mean. So the mean is a pretty nice and clean image. And one, now when you want to see where the model is uncertain, you can, oh, sorry, you can sample from the distribution you can sample from this division. It looks like like video, like images over time, like time lapse, and you can see that the most of the 
of the changes happens at the edges. And now the next step was to train different networks for each network, right? Train different networks in the independently on the same data, but you get, you know, you get some, some stochasticity, right? Uh, in selection of the training data, the order of the batches, etc. So you get different models and you get different uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, distributions for each pixel, certainty distribution for each pixel. And now you can compare these distributions across the different models and you can get an assembly distribution. Now you can actually see which pixels are less, less uh, the, the models are less certain than, than others. And once you do that, you can see, you can see so these are the, the different networks. You can see here four different networks. This is the mean ensemble. So this is the prediction of what you get. This is the disagreement between the different. So you have here four models and here's the disagreement between them. And when you look here, you see that the disagreement is not very high. And when you see here, you can see exactly the points where the models do not agree. And you can see it here with the uh, white arrow, for example, you can see that sometimes you get a very clear cell-to-cell uh, uh, -cell junction, right? The junction that, that connects the two cells in some of the networks and in some of them, you just don't get that. And this is why you get a very high uncertainty here. And using that, you can get some idea regarding the, you know, the confidence of, of, of the result, what you can, the confidence, whether you can trust or not what you get, at least in terms of the network. Okay, so this is just a beautiful video. I think it demonstrates very nicely. I mean, and, and think about it. I mean, when you look at the, at the images here at the left, it's really, I mean, even the human eye cannot do a good localization of the single cell, right? I mean, it's very hard. And after we, my daughter has to be ready for a Kaitana. Hello, Kaitana. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's really nice. So it actually does something that the human eye cannot do, right? I mean, and you can see it, you probably notice that also. I mean, look at, look at here. I mean, you cannot really distinguish the different cells, but the network can do it pretty easily, pretty accurate. Okay, usability. Alina, you asked about usability. So first, this, the team who, who did this project, they are really good about that. They are creating everything is the open source and, and they, they have it, they, they uh, implement the plugins into Fiji, which is the, which is the and, and other platforms that enable uh, uh, people who do not have any programming skills or low programming or not a lot of programming skills. Anyway, it enables anyone to use their models or train on, on, on new data, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, this is the uh, this is the first thing that you must do in order to achieve uh, uh, broad usability. And uh, here is uh, here is uh, someone uh, saying, you know, in the early days of uh, where you see it's it's January 2018. The paper was published in the journal late 2018. The project was already up early 20, 2018. So. Before the paper was even published, there was a preprint, like a year before it was published. This guy uh, took some images and just tried out of the box the models that they, they trained. And you can see very nicely how it worked for them. So they tried the SRRS, the, one of the methods that I told you before about that, uh, versus CARE. And they showed that, and he showed that CARE works out of the box uh, better than the SRRS on their data without training with this type of data at all. Okay. And actually, uh, this guy Guillaume is now, uh, he was a postdoc at, uh, in Finland. Now he has his own lab in Finland. And he actually, one of the things that he did very, very nicely, he's one of the people who generated the platform where, uh, where people can use existing networks and apply, apply it on their data. So this is, uh, they call it, uh, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, uh, zero, uh, zero to, well, anyway, I forgot the name. I'm ashamed of that. But anyway, they have- Zero shot learning. Hmm? No, 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 it's not zero zero shot learning. 
they, it's not zero shot learning. They have a platform that allows, uh, and now they, impl you know, they implement like plugins, they implement different networks to, to this platform, which allow you now to use it uh, on your data or train, uh, or train on your data, everything in the cloud, everything for free, et cetera. And uh, it's not zero shot learning. It's not a technique. It's just a, um, there is not, there is the not name is zero cost DL phonic. Yeah. It's a complicated name. Yeah. Zero cost DL deep learning. What is the last? I mean, it is frozen anyway. Uh, so this is, this is a, a, an important step. And now they implemented there quite a few of these uh, pipelines and they are not the only one. So you get uh, more and more of these that uh, do different uh, aspects of deep learning to microscopy, which basically democratize it now to the wide community of cell biologists that do not need to have a very, not, not, do not need to be very skilled at, uh, at uh, using, uh, you know, using fancy computation or, or deep learning or machine learning, or, and they can use it out of the box. So here are a few examples. On the right here, you see a, you see a system Basically, it's, it's part of what you see on the left in the zero for MIC cost, whatever, uh, but, but the specifically a, a, a system a, a designed for cell segmentation and tracking, which is a very common task in a lot of applications. And uh, you have here the deep cell kiosk, a scalable user-friendly environments for biological image analysis or IMJOY. So you have a lot of, uh, of frameworks that are coming out now. Look at it. I mean, it's all in the last, here, right? Which allow, it's, a, it's a field that is advancing very, very fast. So, which allow people to actually use it. Okay, summary, and then we go to a break. So, Alina, experimental specific information to bypass inner imaging trade off. So, we don't use information that we know about the image acquisition, but we actually exploit the variability of the experimental data, the true experimental data and, and, and the true mapping that you can find within this data to train models and show that it actually works very nicely. Uh, they showed you three modes. First is matched images, high and low, uh, high and low quality images, semi-synthetic 2D and, and reducing the resolution for, for simulating 3D images and completely uh, synthetic training data sets. Okay. אורי, אני בשיעור, בבקשה אל תפריע לאף אחד, בסדר? And hi, hi, yeah. Yeah, so high quality models can be trained from simulated image or without a clean ground truth data, which is key here, because you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get people do matched imaging, high and low resolution, uh, all the time. I mean, it's it's not you know it's a it's a very limiting uh, step in order to actually get it usable, usable by others, which is important. Now people can actually. It's not just a, a, a fancy co computer scientist who want to show to show their trick in cell biology. It can actually be used to to make some impact in the biological domain, which I think is very very important. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And uh, I think we'll go now to a 10 minutes uh, break and we'll come uh, back to talk about some extensions and, and further go to the next example. Any questions before we go to a break? Comments? So see you in uh, 3.25. I'm going to get sure to get, make sure that my kids are okay. They're not killing each other. Okay. Again, please open your cameras. This is the one thing that I'm asking. You can watch later. You can. Disconnect and watch later if you don't want to open it now. Okay, so this was the summary. And, uh, and one of the authors of, of this uh, paper, one of the main uh, authors took it uh, a step ahead and uh, there are all kinds of variation 
of uh, and a variation and, 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 uh, and uh, extensions of uh, from, from a technical perspective. Uh, for example, taking taking two Im two different images of the same uh, object, and uh, and uh, because the noise is is not the noise is going to be uh, stochastic, right? It's actually improved, the, and then you learn one one noisy image to the, to another noisy image of this of the same image. You are going to, I mean, the, the information that is mapped is going to ignore the noise. And noise to void is a cool idea. You take out a pixel from your data and you try to predict the pixel based on the surrounding. And once you do that, you learn relations that are independent of the noise, and you actually learn the structure within your data. And there are also other probabilistic uh, noise to void. And there are, I, I just saw that this week came out another paper. I didn't have time to read. So, so there are a bunch of papers that are uh, related to technical advance, advances uh, in relation to what I showed you uh, today. Uh, if you pick these papers, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you later again toward the end of the class. But these papers, you need to pick two. I mean, it's. If you pick technical, purely technical papers, you need to present two of them. I'll tell you why later. And yeah, and I'll share. I'll share. We I shared with you a list. There is a list of other ideas there. And now, after this, uh, this uh, care came out. Well, actually, Anna Palm is uh, some is uh, another paper, nice papers that I'm going to show you uh, next. Um, but uh, but but then they came out. Uh, th then other papers came out, basically with the same idea of mapping one modality to another modality, and by that improving the quality of the image. Okay, so uh, you can see here a bunch of uh, papers that do it. Uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, came out in the journal another paper that was uh, a long time in uh, in um, in uh, in the pipeline of publishing. It came out as a, as a preprint a long time before. Uh, this PSSR is, uh, I mean, I'm mentioning that because their idea was to introduce uh, what they call a crappifier. So they have something that crappifies an image that reduced uh, the quality of an image artificially. And uh, 2D to 3D uh, and, and deep stone 3D, which is something else. I mean, these are open papers that you can present. Each one has its own, uh, its own trick and the specific, why it's cool for specific data. Uh, all of them were very high, published in very, very good journals and were considered, you know, did a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, noise around them. But basically computationally, it's, it's the same old idea of mapping one modality to another, and that's it. I'm sorry if I, there is not much, uh, much more than that. Now in computer vision, I know that we talked about super resolution in microscopy, which is uh, resolving resolving uh, resolutions which the optics cannot give us. But in, uh, in the context of computer vision, uh, the idea is to exactly what, what we showed now, recovering a high resolution image for one or more low resolution input images. Now, the thing is that this is super resolution is, is, is a field that is, or a subfield in computer vision with a lot of work. See, look at, look at the time, it's, and, and, and Michal Irani and, uh, and Peleg are both Israeli. So you see it goes back to the 90s and uh, the early uh, 20, 2000, and yeah. And, 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 and I want to show you one cool example of, uh, of an approach that was used, that was published uh, in 2009. And there are, there are now better methods for that, but I just want to show you, uh, basically what I want to show you is the time it takes from innovation in computer vision to take until it comes to microscopy. So I want to show you this uh, simple idea. Here is an image. And the idea when looking at this image is that when you look at, at really small uh, regions in, in the image you have, you can look at, at closer parts of the image and at further parts of the image, and you can see similar objects and similar patches just in, in different resolution, right? So if you look at this piece of, uh, what is it? I don't know, some piece of grass or whatever, you can see it here in a very low resolution in, in blue, right, in cyan. But here you can see the same object in a very high resolution. So if you learn these mappings from low to high resolution, in principle, you can take this low resolution image and reconstruct an image with a very high resolution. So this is a paper from Michal Irani's lab. Uh, 
that basically did it on, on one image. They, they, they divided an image into patches and they showed that, uh, that they can, and, and, and they reduced artificially the resolution of patches and then they learned the mapping from a low resolution to a high resolution. And they showed the, and they showed results. They showed how we proved the, 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 the ability to reconstruct an image. So this is an input image. Uh, they reduced the resolution and they did the B cubic interpolation. And, and, and here is with their uh, super resolution technique, they get a much higher, much nicer image. So basically, I mean, they didn't do it at that time with the deep learning, but in principle, it's the same idea, right? And it took almost a decade for this idea to come from a, a computer vision to cell biology. And the reason for that, the reason why cell biology is so behind in terms of uh, technology, and I think it's changing now, I think now the transition becomes faster, is, uh, is uh, that the field, the domain is hard, the domain is difficult. I mean, it's not, uh, if you go, let's say bioinformatics, the alphabet is, uh, is four letters, right? Let's say, for example, genomes, right? It's four letters, so it's, it's, it's not very hard for computer scientists to understand the basic concepts and, and, uh, and the interesting uh, uh, questions and algorithms. But in order to really understand the biology, the microscopy, the talk to a cell biologist, et cetera, there is a higher barrier. And I think this was co causes the delay between innovations in computer science to come to cell biology, which is an opportunity if you think about it, because uh, part of what I do in my research, I'm trying to look for this opportunity. I'm trying to look for cool techniques in computer science and data science, et cetera, that we can borrow and that can make real impact in this huge world of uh, cell biology and microscopy. Okay, questions? Okay, so I want to show you another, another uh, paper, which, uh, which is called the uh, Anna Pal. It actually came out a little before the CARE paper. I just think that the CARE paper is more systematic and shows more things that are and easier to, to follow. I think they, they, I, I really, uh, but, but, the care, but the Anna Pal came out a little bit earlier if there is a, I don't know, dispute or whatever, but I, of course not. And, uh, and, and basically the idea is the same, exploit the structural redundancy of most biological images to reconstruct high quality images from under sample localization microscopy data. In this case, the question is a, a, a super resolution. So fluorescent localization. Uh, and the idea is, if you remember, Nathalie told you about the super resolution microscopy. The idea is that you have these uh, different techniques, but in principle, these uh, blinking uh, diffraction limited spots, right? And if you look at it in wide field, in microscopy, that uh, you just look at the whole sample, you're not going to be able to, to see the structure within it, the structure of the, of the, 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 the specific, the individual molecules. Oh, my, it's not running. And what, what you do here, uh, you use a, a photo switchable um, 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 uh, fluorescent molecules uh, or, or stochastically activated molecules. And then they are activated stochastically. And you take a lot of images where each time you can resolve the individual uh, uh, diffraction limited spots uh, because they're not in dense population anymore. And after you do that, you can reconstruct a localization image to show you a much finer structure of, the, of what you're interested in, okay? So the problem here is that you need to take many, many, many of these images on the left to get the localization image on the right. And many, we're talking here, tens of thousands, okay? Or 100,000 images, okay? We need to take a lot, a lot of images to get to the scale that we see here. I think I wrote here in my, in my comment somewhere the numbers just so I, Ah, no, where did I write the numbers? But I looked at it before. Anyway, it's a 10,000 10, 10, images that you need to, to take in order to reconstruct an image. So this creates a trade-off, right? Between, again, the small number of active floor for a frame to the large number of independent localization. So we need to take a lot of images. It's going to take us a lot of time to do it. We cannot do it fast, right? Because we need to take so many images. Oh.
and, uh, and uh, it's going to limit our ability to image uh, a light, to image large fields of views. Uh, we, we are very limited if we need to take 10,000 pictures each time, each time to get the localization image on the right. So this is exactly a good, uh, a good uh, candidate for this idea of taking uh, low quality images and mapping them to high quality images. What, what would be the low quality image here? No? Remes. Isn't Whitefield the low quality one? Say it again. Yeah, isn't white Whitefield image going to be the input image is going to be the low quality one? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, the, the, the idea is, yes, but it's not the, the, what I'm going to say. I mean, the idea is that you take a, a small, so you have your, instead of 10,000 images, let's take 50 images, okay? And the question is, can we use 50 images to reconstruct what we can do from 50,000 images by learning a mapping that will overcome this diffraction limited uh, uh, problem, okay? And then in, in addition, you add a white field image, which is, so you can take a white field, it's easy to take a white field image. So you can take it as another source of information. Basically they do it here because it's really, it really improved. Basically the white field image gives you a lot of information on how to, so you have a lot of information mapping from the white field to the localization, but what they'll show in the paper is that the taking a not so many of the diffraction limited images with the white field creates really good localization. So this is the idea of the paper, okay? And now we'll, now we'll dig in. So what you can see here in orange, <coughs> is the localization images. And you see this uh, uh, capital K, which is big compared to the small K, right? So you have here many, many 10,000, 100,000 images of, uh, of these uh, diffraction limited spots, the uh, blinking uh, floor pores. And instead we want to take K, which is much smaller than the capital K uh, uh, frames and use that in order to train a mapping between the small K to the large K image, okay? And wide field is just easy to take. So we take a wide field image in order to, to provide more information. You see that it's really helpful. You have a lot of information in the wide field image because it gives you the, all the context. So in principle, I'm going to give a spoiler. I thought of doing that later, but because you asked someone, I'm going to give a spoiler. The wide field give you the, the, the structural, the, the general structure, you have most of the structure in the wide field image mapping to a super resolution image. But then the, the, the small number of frames uh, of the diffraction limited spots give you the fine details. Okay, and, 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 and now, now we go to show that. Okay, so what do we have here? We have the wide field. So we take the wide field, we, we create a larger image from it because we have a higher resolution. Why right? we want to get to a much higher resolution. We take the, the small, the, the K frames and we create from that a super resolution image, which is not great at all because we didn't take enough uh, frames in order to resolve all the, all the diffraction limited spots. Are you following me or am I talking completely? Yeah, we are, we are following you. Say a few people at least nod it with your head or say can or whatever. Yeah, okay. Because this is the key here, this is how it works, right? So you take your, like you usually, microscopists reconstruct the, the super resolution images from the, the 10,000 images. Here you can reconstruct an image just, just from 50 images, which is not great. And now you train uh, basically an, a unit like uh, network and you map these two images into what they call Anna Palm. Anna is the artificial neural network, something, I don't know. And, uh, and basically you learn the mapping from the wild field plus a Palm with very limited data to Palm with uh, a lot of data. What you see here in the right are different measurements for, uh, for, the, 
for the uh, for the error for the graduate missions, right? For training the network. So they combine different things, different uh, measurement that relate to the ability to reconstruct back the wide field image. So you, whether you can go, how well you can go from the high resolution image back to the wide field image to the low resolution image, and uh, how well you can go to the to the um, to the palm image and etc. I mean, they did all kind of uh, all kind of uh, measurements that, uh, that relate to the. And I think I, I can go over this, but I think it doesn't give you a lot of uh, of insight the, the the measurements that they used. And uh, and eventually they did optimi optimization on that, and now you can see we can see the results. Once we have a network, then all that we need to do is take a wide field image, take k small k number of images, right? Do the use the network, and uh, yeah, increase the take take this wild field and just uh, inflate it. Take these uh, images and create a palm with a small k, put it into the network, get an output. And now what they also showed is that you can take this output, reconstruct the the the, the low quality image. And then also see the error map between the generated low quality image to the true low quality image. And then you can see where, again, it's kind of a measurement of a visual measurement of the, of the errors is where you are not sure about the ability to, to reconstruct back the information, right? So basically this is, this is all. And now you can look at data. So here you can see the wild field image. See, it's a pretty crappy image. Here you can see the sparse palm image. So this is based on, uh, I don't remember how many frames is it. Ah, here, uh, 6,000 uh, frames. And yeah, okay, anyway, this is how it looks, right? And uh, this is the perfect palm. So this is taking n equal to, uh, ah, this, I think, uh, yeah, these are simulated images. So here's, uh, again, the use simulation. So this is n to, to uh, infinity, right? Here they, they simulated what happens if you do palm on, on a lot, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, taking a lot, a lot of images. This is what you can get the best. And this is what Anna Palm gives you, which you see is, is quite, uh, is quite uh, good. This is from the wild field alone, which is already pretty good. So basically what you see here in the upper right corner, you see a network that was trained from the wild field to the palm images, to the perfect images. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll draw it. So learning this mapping, right? This is what you get here, which is it's pretty amazing. I mean, think you take these images and you create these images. And what you see here is from taking this plus this, and generating this. So you add the information here, the, 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 the sparse palm imaging. And you can see here, for example, uh, let's see, let me clean the screen. You can see here, for example, that when you, when you map from here to here, what you get is you, don't, you, you cannot get the fine details here, right? Which, so here it looks very different. You can see that this looks very different from here. Going from the wide field to the, to the um, super resolved image, you get a pretty nice structure, but when you have some, some dense uh, filaments, you, you, it's really hard to, to resolve them. And when we add this uh, dense labeling, this uh, sparse labeling, sorry, spatial labeling, you can resolve these things and see much better quality of, of the local structure within your data. Okay. Saf, what are exactly the palm pictures? What, what are the objects there or what is the technique? What, what are the palm pictures? And what is it? Is it like, uh, I don't know, what is it? Ah, palm is...
פאוור אאוטרייג' הפסקת חשמל, איזה כיף, what a timing, well, uh, thanks for staying, for keeping there, so uh, Leon, I, I disappeared when you, now I have just one screen, that's another problem, and we're limited by my battery, and, and, my, my, and my cell phone battery, uh, okay, so Leon, you asked uh, what is Palm, is, uh, Palm is uh, just a super resolution technique, Natalie, Natalie talked about it in it's just one. There is Palm and Storm and others. I, I don't want to repeat exactly the, uh, what happens in, what, what are the differences between each, each one. Okay, Seda? Leon? No, uh, Asaf, I, I think what Leon asked was, they, they look like microtubes. Right, if I'm not wrong. Ah, the, uh, the, the objects are microtubules, yeah. Yeah. But I think Leon asked about the technique. What is the problem? Anyway, now we have answered to both. Asaf, what is the merged one in the bottom right? The merged one is taking the Anna Palm, right? The, uh, the, the, the lower left image. And overlaying it over the, the the perfect image, the perfect palm in two channels. So when you see yellow, it means that you have the what well, yellow is what is uh, red and uh, uh, red and uh, green, right? I'm, I'm always confused with that. Anyway, when you see yellow, it means that they are they fit each other. They are co-localized. The, the 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 palm. And it means when when yellow, it means that it's it's a it's a there is a good reconstruction, okay? If you don't see yellow, it means, if you see only red or only green, it means that you are getting one channel, not in the other. It's just a visualization. Basically, it's a comparison of the bottom here, of the two bottom images. Okay, so uh, here is the validation. On this, so I, I told you, I, I started by confusing uh, you, I think, but I told you this is simulated images. So we know the ground truth, we can get the, 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 the perfect uh, imaging. And these are uh, simulated images. So what we, what we can see here, uh, on the x-axis, we see the localization count. So it goes from 10 to the third, this is 1,000, right? To uh, 1 million uh, uh, snapshot images, right? Of the, the, of the diffraction limited spot. Uh, and what we see in the y-axis is the is a measure for the reconstruction accuracy. And so when we look at the at the black uh, line here, this is palm. So you can see very clearly that there is a, a, a gradual uh, increase in the in the similarity measure, right? So when you take a small number of images, you get something that is not similar, 0.2. And when you get a million images, you get something that is very, very similar to the, to the ground truth, to the uh, perfect image, uh, but, the, but it's a lot of work going from here to here. When you look at the, at the blue, uh, there is a dotted, the uh, dashed blue and the, and the blue, the complete blue uh, uh, plots, you can see uh, Anapal with the sparse imaging and Anapal with the sparse plus white field. So first, the wild field is, is the is the dashed red line. I, I think it's maybe it's not. I uh, know. Oh yeah, the red one is the anapal with the wild field. So it doesn't depend, of course. The wild field is just an image. It doesn't depend on the number of uh, of snapshots you take from the from the diffraction limited spot. So uh, for, so what you get here is an accuracy. Basically, you get your most of the accuracy from the wild field, as you can see, and as we saw visually before, right? I mean. This is the wild field. You get most of what you get is from here. Oh, and electricity is back. So this is what we get here in the red line. In the blue dashed line, we can see what happens if we just take the sparse imaging. Okay. So you can see it starts pretty low, but then it grows much faster than just taking the the palm imaging. So as you go here to to 10 to the fourth, to 10,000 images without the wild field image, you already get something that is very close to the, to the perfect image. And when you take both, when you take the, the wild field and the timers of the images, you see that you start uh, pretty high 
but you get higher. Okay? And, and this is exactly now, and we know, and, and in principle you say, okay, this is not a huge change, but, but the differences, as you can see here, is actually the things that we care about the most, which is the fine details. I mean, why do we do super resolution if we cannot look at the fine details? Okay? Questions? Questions? I'm trying to figure out how I see, how can I see you again? Oh, I need to. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now after we just looked at synthetic images, let's look at the real experimental images. And well, it's really nice to show, but yeah, there is nothing new computationally. I mean, basically it works, okay? So you can see when you take the wide feed, you get pretty nice reconstruction, but if you compare it to the uh, ground truth with here in, with uh, 30,000 images, you get this uh, filament here that is completely missed in the reconstructed image from the wild field. And if we add uh, uh, 300, only 300 uh, uh, K, small K of 300, we can get this information in the reconstructed image. And what we can do now is actually uh, show how the different number of uh, images it, it allows us to create, uh, to create a reconstruction. So when we use the, the wide field, we can get from the beginning, we get pretty good reconstructions, but we need more, uh, more uh, you know, images in order to get the structure right, the local, the defined properties of the structure right. While if you use only the localization images, we need much more time in order to get there. And here is a, a, a real application of that. So here you take a, a big field of view, so in order to do it uh, normally with three, with 30,000 uh, images, we'll need to, it, we, we'll never be able to do that. Take such a huge field of view and image that, that resolution and look how, what a nice resolution you can get here. So, so what they did is again, take a huge wide field, take, uh, go over the, the different regions and take just, a, just a, not, not many images, just uh, uh, yeah, just one thousand images in ten, instead of uh, I don't know thirty thousand images, and now we can do this and get this uh, resolution. So the high throughput here is looking at large field of views, which we couldn't do it without this uh, trick. Okay, and now like we did with care, and uh, we have the question: Would it work for a different system, or when we change something in our system, right? Lambda le ze and, and, and the, the idea here again is to see that it's not just good for one setting, but it actually works for general, more general setting. So what they did here is they did a perturbation. What is a perturbation? They added uh, this uh, small, uh, this uh, molecule uh, called taxol. It's, it's a drug that, that affects uh, microtubules. So it changes the, 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 the structure and the physical properties of the microtubules. And they, they checked if a network that was trained on control data, data that was not perturbed, can still, still predict the structure of, uh, of, of uh, a cell that was perturbed. 
אז ממש טיפלו בתאים and they changed something in the cells, the cells themselves. And now the question is in the microtubules, in the cells, and now the question can they still improve images that have never seen this type of, uh, of uh, treatment to the cell? And the answer is of course yes. And now they show that they can take very little data of another structure, which is not microtubules. In this, they took one image of nuclear pores, which is the, the blue, the yellow dots that you see here. You see here yellow, small yellow dots. This is the, this is the nuclear pores, uh, the mo molecules in the nuclear pores. And they showed that they can take the same network, they can, uh, uh, and they can use one image in order to now predict a localization of another uh, molecule. So you can image multiple things. Okay, to sum up uh, both parts. So again, leveraging experimental specific information uh, to bypass inherent imaging trade-offs. So with CARE, it was taking crappy images and improving them. And in Anapal, it was taking uh, images uh, also crappy with the, with the wild field, but also taking uh, just a much shorter time scale, uh, fewer images in time, and reconstructing images that require usually much more time. Uh, in Anapal, you can see that you can do that without the availability of clean ground truth data. So first, they use simulation. But even if using experimental data, you just, you don't need to do, yeah, I mean, simulation works. If you want to be general, you can do it on, on your own specific experimental data, but you can do it easily. You can take the, just all the images and then look at, you know, just look at the subset of it. And this is your training data. So you don't need to, to, to annotate anything and do something very complex in terms of the experiment specifically. Uh, in some, you know, you need to be careful about that, but in principle, it works well out of the box, but you need to make sure that you know what you're doing. And importantly, and this is the next topic, it, the, use it for downstream analysis. So if you want to look at microtubules, we want to look at the structure of the microtubules, how straight they are, how many microtubules are they, how they change in space and time, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to look at the, at the developing, uh, I don't know, uh, developing whatever, Drosophila with a fruit, fruit fry or, or zebra, zebra fish, uh, um, whatever, we want to actually track the single cell. So what we want to do is the ability to do the post-processing. Notice that we're not making any assumptions about the specific intensity measurement in each pixel. I mean, we do that in the optimization process, but but considering that and, and counting on that to actually draw biological conclusion, it's, I, I would be very, very careful about that. Uh, Karen and Anapal were the first, but after them, there, there was a flood of, uh, of the, same, the same idea on different uh, data modalities. And uh, each one had its own tricks in terms of uh, what, uh, what network settings they use and how, especially what data. So this is the big thing, right? How, how you can answer new questions on a new, on a new, uh, uh, on a new set of, uh, on, of uh, a new set of questions with, with a completely different data. And this is why these papers were so, uh, they were impactful because each paper was really improved something that couldn't, you couldn't do before. But, but the computational idea was exactly the same. Super simple, super, you know, Super straightforward. Uh, we have we've seen similar ideas in computer vision. It took time to come from computer vision to cell biology. There are other opportunities. Like I have some ideas of what would be the next uh, thing that will come from cell biology, from from computer science, data science to to cell biology. Uh, I really recommend you to read the perspectives that I I, I cited. Uh, from 2019, I think it's written uh, really, really nicely to learn about the topic. So this is this is the this is the paper application promise and pitfall of deep learning for fluorescent image reconstruction. Okay, questions before we continue. Okay, so let's take an eight-minute break until uh, four ten. And then we do the last, uh, the last uh, lesson, last hour of the class.
Any questions before that? Comments? Hello.
Okay. Let's continue. Okay, we, so tell me please in the, if I forget the last 20 minutes I want to devote to the, to the lecture, to the student lecture. So if I forget, if I get excited about something, tell me to go back to reality. Okay, so I, I think by that we mostly cover the enhancing cell image quality with deep learning. Uh, there are a lot of papers in the list that I shared with you that do, but basically it's the same thing. I mean, it's mapping from one modality way to, to another, uh, low quality to high quality, wide field to super resolution, blah, 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 et cetera. I mean, it's, just, it's basically the same thing again and again. So computational lasers, usually there are not any new, uh, new ideas that I think for us. Okay. Let's uh, move, uh, let's turn gears and move up a bit. So this is the basic question of cell biology. We want to look at the cell and know what it did, what it uh, will do. And basically the whole thing about, um, about microscopy is that we can see, and this is the only technique that allows that, to see the state of the cell and see what it is actually doing and, 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 and see how it transition from one state to another. For example, uh, uh, stem cells that decide to differentiate to, right, to, to, muscle, uh, to muscle cells, or, uh, or cells that decide to die. In, uh, in cancer, we put uh, drugs on our cells and they decide to die. You can, you can, you can do snapshots and uh, you, know, you, know, you can take your, your uh, your uh, tissue and uh, uh, before and after and see that there are many dead cells. But if you want to understand what happens within this tissue and how the cells spread the, across a population, whether boom, they all die at once, or maybe one cell dies and then it tells its neighbor, hey, you should die now. And then he dies and then the other, and then it propagates. In order, and in order to, to really understand that, and, and really to link uh, the, the, the different molecules to the function, we need to we need microscopy. And the basic question of cell biology is: Can we look and understand how a cell is built and what it's doing from its component? So what you see here is a nice uh, um, 3D reconstruction of a cell uh, by each color is a different molecule, it's a different organelle within the cell, and you can see how everything is tightly packed and organized and together it's built the cell and together it gives us the, the, the many functions that cells can do. And this is the holy grail. This is the big question in the field. Can we understand that? Can we learn that and can we? And one of the main limitation is that we cannot see that in, in, in real microscopy. Why? Because each time we can tag one molecule, two molecules, three molecules, right? I mean, look at the images that I showed you before. You can, you can see just one color or two colors or three colors. So we cannot get an integrated picture of a cell by tagging fluorescent molecules to each of the specific organelles. Organelles is like organs, ebronim, it's like evarim shelata, right? And from that understand the complexity of its organization within it and how it correlates to the function of the cell. And it's a technical limitation because the molecular heart biology is difficult, trying to tag all of these uh, fluorescent molecules to each of the cells. And then also the optics is different because you image your cells and there are the wavelengths that are interfering with one another and then you need to computationally resolve them. So it's really a huge limitation and the world record, like the nicest papers that came out, that talked about, and, and there is now, usually the, the field was because of that, because of this technical uh, uh, limitation, most of the field was working molecule by organelle by organelle. So you tag an organelle, you try to understand something about your or this organelle, and then you move to the next organelle. And in the last few years, there is a whole field that is opening up in cell biology, which is uh, talk to, talking about organelle-organelle communication, organelle-organelle uh, um, interaction, right? How they are interacting with one another, these different organelles. But again, the technical limitation of imaging multiple, multiple organelles at once, this is the rate-limiting step. 
And uh, the nicest paper came out in, uh, I think, 2017 or 18. Maybe I'll show you next, uh, next, next time some videos and some data from there. It's a cell biological paper. The computational aspects are simple, but uh, it was like a, it was like a show off that they could image six different organelles in the same cells. But again, it was the one best lab in the world to do this, that can do these things. And it took the, the postdocs that did it like five years. So five years, what they reached is the ability to brag and, and, and come with some, some biological insight, but to brag that they can image six different organelles in the same cell and look at their interaction. So this is a huge limitation. Now, one of the, there is a lot of uh, efforts today to try to tackle that. And if you see, and a lot of it is actually philanthropic efforts. So what I'm going to show you now is the Ellen Institute of Cell Science, which our Ellen is Paul Ellen, is the, is the founder of, uh, one of the, co the co-founder of Microsoft. And he, he opened multiple institutes for science. He decided what are the most important scientific questions and domains that uh, needs to be solved and he poured money there. So one was the brain science, Ellen Institute for Brain Science. It's, uh, it's there for over 10 years now, I think. And then there is, uh, there is Ellen Institute for Machine Learning. It's all in Seattle, right? I mean, Microsoft. Ellen Institute for Machine Learning. There is Ellen Institute for Cell Science, which is what I'm talking on here. And there is a, now an Ellen Institute for Immunology, Marek Chisun. Um, in cell science, the, 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 the goal, the mission, you can see it here, the mission is to create a dynamic multiscale visual model of cell organization, dynamics, and activities that capture experimental observations, theory and prediction, uh, behavior, normal, pathological contexts, right? So there is a whole institute with, uh, well, and also many, many other labs with the goal to understand how a cell is organized internally. And I really like this institute. And actually, we are also working with them, kind of collaborating with them, because they're really about, they're not like what an individual lab can do. You know, I can solve a problem and write a paper or something. I'm not an experimentalist. So experimental lab can generate some data and put it out, but they're working like a factor. But, but we need to publish papers, right? We need to get to some, we get some, uh, we get our funding and we need to use it in order to produce papers. And they care less about it and more about actually making a, a impact to the whole field. So they have like a factory wide uh, setting where they have a farm of microscopes and they are generating cells with specific uh, specific organelles tagged, fluorescently tagged with like the best uh, techniques available there. And they give the cells to anyone. So if you now want to take their cells which are also cool cell system, but I'm not going to talk about it. And you want to image that in your lab, no problem. They'll send it to you. And they use this form of microscopes. They, they are going to validate these cells much better than any individual lab does. Uh, does. Uh, they, are, they are imaging tons of uh, high quality 3D images of the cells under different conditions and different uh, organelles uh, left fluorescently labeled. So they are making huge amounts of, uh, of uh, microscopy data that is publicly available. It's actually really, really, really quality and you can actually use it to ask different, to develop tools, to ask questions, to, to, to visualize and just, you know, just stare at these images to, to gain some insight just from staring at them as they are developing computational tools and they are letting the field use. But I think the impact, I really, I'm, I'm a, a fan, right? And I'm, I'm really, I'm really supporting what they do. They are not the only ones who do that. Now there is also an initiative in the Hen Zuckerberg initiative and Zuckerberg is, uh, Zuckerberg is the Facebook guy, Mark Zuckerberg. Han Hen is the, her, his uh, wife, which is, and they came up with this institute that they said that they are going to solve all the diseases in the next, uh, I don't know, year, many years. Well, the, but, 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 but what they do, they really, they really put uh, funds into technology development in these fields. And they have a biohub, they have uh, like a, a research institute also that collaborates with the Bay Area universities, with the Stanford and the Berkeley and the UCSF. And so, so these are two initiatives that generate a, a lot of data, of imaging data. They generate a, a computational tools. Uh, they generate, and, and they, they drive the field forward. Ah, there is also another thing. There is a Genelia research company. Genelia is a, is a HHMI. It's another philanthropic effort. It's a, they 
that they are they have the best microscope builders in the world and the best microscope in the world you can you can actually go there in order to, to use their microscopes and take uh, images with their microscope uh, and uh, and uh, they looked for they they actually asked the, the community the whole biological community what are the big problem what is the big problem that we now should pour a quarter milliard dollars in the next 10 years or something and eventually what they decided was I can't remember the exact name but cell in a physiological context so how a cell in not in a dish but in a context of a tissue of an animal imaging that and understanding how it works these are so anyway I'm talking and talking but the, the idea is that these are super important questions everybody understands that these are the questions that needs to be tackled and the philanthropic effort are actually giving here a really big boost in, in terms of what is really needed to solve that. And part of what they do is generate huge and, and high quality data sets that were not available before uh, that allow computational uh, guys or girls, right, to, to actually to mine them and, and ask new questions and develop new tools, which is, I think it's huge and the impact is going to be huge. Now, currently, these data sets are, are mo there is a lot, a lot of people who are actually playing with them. They're really raw, which is again, an opportunity. So we are playing with uh, the Ellen Institute data sets a lot and with some other data sets in the lab. And uh, it's, it's pure gold. I mean, it's just, you have, there's so much, you can extract so much information from this data, which is cool. So what you see here is uh, uh, what they do and all the contributions that they do. So they have uh, visualizations. You can uh, you can look the Ellen Cell Explorer. You can start and look at how cells look and how it is composed. Uh, they have uh, they develop uh, cells that you can take with gene editing, and they go do, do quality controls and uh, and they develop uh, different assays and they do microscopy and blah blah blah. So they it's really cool. And I included here a few links. I'm not going to go into that because of uh, time, but really I mean. I really recommend you guys to just, you know, just, just uh, the Tailu um, in, in their website. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, okay, so I told you that we cannot image many organelles in with the same living cell. There are other initiatives. I think I'll have a, I'll, I'll have a lesson on, about public data sets, et cetera. And, and then I'll go and I'll tell you which public data set, what, what each data set is and what is it good for and what is it, what, what, what can, yeah, what, what people can do with it. But not now, because I just remember two other data sets that I didn't mention. And, okay, uh, so the holy grail, if we can take a cell and reconstruct the localization of different organelles within it, then we overcome all the technical difficulties and we can get an integrative image of a cell and start learning really in a living cell uh, all, the, all the interactions and all the relations between the different organelles. So if we can do that without, so without taking an image or without tagging our organelles, take a, a bright field image, just image yourself and then use generative models to actually uh, predict where the different organelles are going to be localized. And then we're going to have an integrated image of the cell. If we have this technology, I mean, it's a Nobel Prize. Again, if we have it and if it, if it works, it's Nobel Prize, I mean, I'm recording, right? I need to be careful, but it's easily a Nobel Prize, I would say, because, you know, it's much, you, it's much more important than super resolution. Don't, don't tell Natalie that I say that, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really groundbreaking. Okay, so now I build the, the, the tension, right? So if, if we can do that, the future of augmented microscopy would be that you can take, uh, you know, you can do data collection and then you can uh, take different, uh, uh, combine it with different data sets and do model training and then have different questions on the same data sets and integrate everything together and get a holistic representation of the super complex biology that currently we can only look at it from one, every time we look at it from one angle and we miss everything else. So this would be really a revolution. And this is where we're trying to go as a field. Okay, but I didn't show you even if it's possible or nothing, of course, right? So, so this is the idea. 
And these are the two seminal papers that I want to go over, uh, go, go through today. And there are other papers now, but again, these are the two that I, the first and the ones that I think are most, uh, uh, yeah, the, the ones that started the thing. And not this, yeah. yeah, there are some limitations there, but yeah, but I, I'll talk about it. But the idea is as follows. We take a bright field image, we use predictive models to generate different channels. So each channel is a diff different organelle. And now we can start in correlating the different organelles, try to understand how a cell is built and how, when a cell decides to do something, how its internal structure is, organization is changing. And when a disease occurs, when, when you get cancer, right? Not you, someone, I don't know, someone else gets cancer, what is different there in, in terms of the organization? And then maybe we can find drugs that reverse that. Just one example, right? I mean, to give motivation. So the idea is as follows. It's really hard to label fluorescently a lot of organelles, but we can do it with one organ. So what we can do here is each time, and we, we showed that the Ellen Institute did that, right? I mean, they have part of their data is this data, these cells, where each cell is labeled with a different organelle, a cell system with a different organelle label. So if we have now cells with one organelle label, and we can learn a mapping, so we can now train a generative model to map the bright field image to a reconstruction of the fluorescent target. So this is the input. Let me draw that. So this is the input. We learn a model to go from here to here. And the model is trained based on, this is the ground truth, right? So this is the error is, is, is based on how well the reconstruction resembles the reconstruction here. here. It's very similar to the care, to the, to the Anna Palm, just the modality is different. It's not improving the resolution of an image, but it's predicting a different modality. It's predicting a different, a different structure. And if we can do that, and it's a big if, because it's not necessarily that you can, uh, who says that the, the bright field image contain information regarding the molecular organization? I don't know. But if we can do that, then now we can train different model, each one trained on a separate data set of one organelle. And now we can take a bright field image with nothing uh, labeled within it and generate all these fake images which will give us a, a holistic representation of a cell. It's amazing if it works. I'm going to show you now an example, which is, uh, which, which, which is uh, very, I think, uh, convincing. So this is, this is the input. This is the only thing that is real here. The rest is fake. And whoever looks at these images, it looks real. I mean, it looks like real microscopy images. And, and what you see here, and it's really hard to see from the bright field images, is a cell undergoing mitosis, dividing. One cell becoming two cells. It, it's really hard to see here. I, we'll see it later. I'll, I, I will we'll pinpoint it here. But, 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 but when we use these generative models, right? From here, we generate all these images, sequences. We can see here the DNA that is splitting, right? Here it's one, but here it's already two. We can see, yeah. The input is the bright field and the tagged organelles, right? No. So I, I missed something. Okay, so I'll go one slide back. Two slides back. We have one organelle, okay? Each cell, cell system has one organelle tag labeled fluorescently. Okay. So what we can learn is a model that can on take a bright field images, image and generate one organelle. This is the training. Okay. So what what is tagged? Here it's something a nuclear marker. I don't know what exactly DNA. So when it tagged, it's it, it, you produce a picture of it, no? Yeah, but yeah, but what we learn here is a generative model. The, the, the ground truth here is a, is a matched image of bright field and, uh, and the fluorescent image of the DNA. Okay, so in the input, you have 
two components. One is the bright field and the other is the tag. No, 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 no. Okay. no. Um, the, input, the input is a bright field image. You, 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 you build a network that needs to reconstruct the, the matching fluorescent target. So the network gets, so, okay. So experimentally, you image a bright field and the experimentally, uh, the, the, the fluorescent tagged image. Okay, this is what you have from, the exp from one experiment, okay? Okay. Okay, but for the, for the machine learning, you take a bright field image and you learn a mapping, a gener gener generative, gen you know, a model that will take a bright field image and will generate from it a fluorescent image, a corresponding fluorescent image. And you use the ground rules here to train the network. So how do you how do you build this model of the tag the image based on previous knowledge of previous pictures, right? So this is this is what okay. So I'll, this is what we get from an experiment, okay? But this is just just the training. So we have training, and we have next we use what we are going to train, okay? We have this as training. This is a model, a deep learning net, network, okay? I'll mm -hmm. show you, I mean, it could, could be anything, but I'm going to show you networks, of course, which takes as input a, just a bright field and it goes through the networks and it generates a prediction of the fluorescent target. When we train this network, we back propagate the errors based on the discrepancy from the prediction to the fluorescent target. How can you predict if, if you never seen the localization of the tag, the organism? You could ask the same question. If you want to do it for the content aware image restoration, it's the same thing. Basically, how can you predict something new from something that the information, you know, you learn a mapping from one to the second. If, if the mapping doesn't exist, if I'm going, if this is going to be crap, this is going to be junk, we're not going to learn any real mapping. So it start, if you look at it, we start with the mapping that is bad, but it, 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 through iteratively, the model is optimized and it improves by optimizing, by reducing, minimizing the discrepancy between the prediction and the ground truth image. Okay. Okay, think about it. Uh, maybe you need a little more time, but but uh, but now when you have it, you can you can you have a, a network that gets a bright field image and can map it into a fluorescent image. And now we can do something like this because we have for each organelle we have a different model that we trained independently. And now we take an image, a bright field image, and we use model one, model two, model three, etc. And for each model we generate. The localization of the organelle, but this image is not labeled with anything. Okay, it just that in the training we learn this mapping from a bright field to to the localization of each molecule. And now once we have it, here is an example. And here, what you can see here is a dividing cell, right? So you can see the DNA splitting from one to two. You can see here you don't here you don't see a, a membrane going between the cell. Etc. You can see very clearly a cell dividing. And now when we know that and we look here, we can actually see, I mean, here are the two cells, but it's really hard, I mean. And what it means, well, the ability to do that, and this is what you, the ability to do this mapping from a bright field to a fluorescent image, it means that the bright field images contain implicit hidden information that allows us to do this transformation. So the texture of the image with, within the bright field contains the information that allows this reconstruction where every, where the, the, the organism within the cell is located. It's pretty amazing. Question. Uh, I have a question. So you said uh, this is the Holy Grail and this is a Nobel Prize if one can achieve this, but it seems like they achieved it, so. Yeah, but, but I said also if it worked. So it, it doesn't work? It works, you know, but it has a lot of limitations. It mm -hmm. works in very specific conditions. And here, when I say, when I, when I stress that on the hallucination effects, right? Here mm -hmm. hallucination would be, would kill you. Because if you want to understand, uh, if you want to understand where, where organelles are touching each, each other, 
but you cannot trust the localization of your organelle. It's not anymore just a general similarity of images. You want to really know that what you get is, is right, right? And if you get false organelles, then it's a problem because you cannot learn any biology out of it. And if you perturb yourself, if you do now a perturbation, if you put some drug on yourself and something within yourself change, can you trust? Even if, if, even if your control cells are, 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 you learn the model, can you trust uh, uh, if you want to learn what the perturbation did, what the treatment did? Can you trust it or not? It's, it's a question. I mean, we'll go through it and we'll see some data and we'll, it's, but it's an open question. And, you know, we are far away from this Nobel Prize that I'm saying now, no one is going to trust the biology that you can get out of it. But it's still, first, it's very impressive, even just to show that the information is hidden there. And you'll see that you can learn some things about that. You can get some insight about that. And it's, you know, it's a field that is just, uh, it's emerging. There were the papers that came out uh, last week, a preprint that came out last week, that I I was uh, I, I might still include in the course. I'm, I'm I'm not sure if I want or not, and you can pick it also. But I'll uh, that, that actually shows some nice uh, nice applications of that. And and in, in and in the lab in in my lab we also were trying to work on on these aspects as well. But in this uh, in this example. Uh, you have a quantitative measure that you can say how well it works because you have the fluorescent of these bright field images, right? In this case, we do not have, uh, well, at least they say that they don't have, uh, they don't show it, they show just the bright field and the fluorescent channel. But yeah, you could in principle uh, label now DNA and, and show that, you know, that it's true, that the timing of the division is captured properly. And then you can say, okay, if I want, and you do it on a lot of data, and then you say, okay, if what I care about is the timing of division, timing, I want to, uh, to detect the division, I can use this in silico. In silico is in the computer, right? In mm -hmm. silico labeling, it's called, uh, they call it uh, in silico labeling uh, or synthetic cell, or I don't know what, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can actually, I, oh, can you back my? Okay, I Okay. Um, ah, yeah. So you can de develop now quantitative measure, prove that it's good for this application, and use it. Right? People don't do it yet exactly, but next week we'll we'll hear a little more about that. Okay. So the architecture is just a unit. It's the same thing. And, uh, and here you can see some uh, examples. And you can see here, this is the input. This is the target. This is what you want to do. And this is the prediction. Notice that it's not only that we get a nice prediction of the localization. Actually, it's look even nicer. The prediction looks nicer than the, than the ground truth image. Why is that? Why do you think the prediction? Why it's less grained? Yeah. The contrast is bigger in the prediction. No, it uh, removes the stochastic noise, maybe. Exactly. Think about it. As a model, we're trying to capture structure within our data. Noise has no structure, right? It's, it's assuming that it's random noise. Most of what we see here in the background is just random, right? background noise. So the network cannot learn that, which actually comes to our advantage because now we can generate nicer images, which are even better for post-processing, right? So in, 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 uh, in that case, yeah. Uh, and again, if we talk about similarity measured, we don't really care about correlation between the background pixels, for example, to the ground truth. We see, we see here that it's fine. And, 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 and defining better measurement for similarity based on some tasks that you want to achieve is a, could be a good product for this course. So you can do the prediction are in 3D, which is cool. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and nicely, they have a, a, lot, a, a library of many structures. So this is just from their a cell catalog. So you can buy these cells with with, with, the, with different organelle uh, tags within them. So you can have to take an image of them. So they have like, I think 19 different, no, 
They have even 30 or something now cell, cell, cell lines, but they have 19 big data sets that you can play with. And uh, here are different, uh, you know, this is the target and this is the prediction. And you can see that the results are relatively good, not always. Look at the tight junction, for example, at the bottom, almost at the bottom left here. You can see the tight junction, which is uh, the ground truth on the left is nice. And on the right, you get something much dimmer and less structured. And uh, they could quantify that. So what you see here, and here the similarity measure is just, just plain correlation. So pixel correlation, the intensity of a pixel, you correlate the prediction to the ground truth. And this is how well you are reconstructing your, your images. And you can see that some image, some structures and each, uh, each uh, name here is a structure. You can see that some structures are uh, reconstructed better than other structures. And the, the black uh, line here is the theoretical maximal correlation. And it came with actually, it, it, it was pretty cool how they did it. And uh, they took the noise within their system within this die. So each of these has a, has a different uh, fluorescent uh, marker, right? Each fluorescent marker has its own noise and background, uh, uh, background the intensities that are disturbing, right? The, the prediction. So what they did, they looked, they added the noise based on what they know on the ground truth image, and they showed how well it can be reconstructed. And this gives an upper limit. So it shows how, what are our current uh, results, but how we can still uh, improve. Uh, and actually now in the lab, we replicated these results and we're moving on to, to ask different questions, which I'm, I'm going to tell you maybe, maybe next lesson. Next, next lesson is, is not next week, it's in two weeks. So I'm over my time and I think we should go to, ah, we should go to the papers. I also prepared a few slides for that. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so pick a paper and schedule yourself for class presentation. And this, this is 20% of, your grade in the course. A presentation is in pairs. If someone wants uh, to be alone, then fine. But the pairs is a more technical restriction because I just want to be, I want it to be effective, right? I don't want it to, I want to teach you other things, right? I want to, to have time to teach you myself and not spend all the too many, too many weeks on, uh, on student presentations. I distributed the list of uh, papers. There is a reason why these papers are there. If you want a specific paper, you know, you really want and you really feel uh, strongly about it and tell me and convince me and fine, I'll be, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you no, probably, but you need to really, you need to really work hard to convince me. And uh, the list I picked are important papers that I think from the field and the newish papers I think are either important, interesting, or ones that I didn't have a chance to read or explore yet. So I said, okay, this is an opportunity. So we might get a few that are not great, but you know, but uh, but the idea is uh, to 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 do a literature survey in this uh, course. Uh, last, uh, so this is the second round of the course. The, in the first round, I did it. I didn't limit in time, and it was more like, okay, you take a paper and you come back and you present, it and this is all. It didn't work well. First, because students uh, spent a lot of time presenting their papers. Each paper was like half an hour. Now, I, I now spent more than half an hour on CARE or in the Anna Palm, but it had a specific, I could present it also in two minutes. I had a specific purpose to teach you the general ideas. And these are like the milestone papers on the field. I think these are the, the they had all these cool ideas that I wanted to highlight, but there is no reason to do that. I mean, if we see now again, the same, a very similar paper on a different domain, you just need to say, this is the domain, this is, you know, just, just say what is cool specifically about this paper. You don't need to give an overview, an overview of the whole of everything. So it didn't work well because it took too much of the course and because students didn't know how to pinpoint. So it was not effective. I mean, one student was presenting and the other class was kind of sleeping and I was talking with them. It was very little interaction and it wasn't really good learning. I think it wasn't, wasn't effective learning. So uh, I decided to change the structure. First, limiting the time. So each presentation is going to be 10 minutes plus five minutes for discussion. That's all. 
in 10 minutes, you need to convey the, the highlight of your paper, the highlights, why it is important, the highlight results, et cetera, of the paper, plus five minutes for discussion. I'm going to be very strict about this timing. So we're going to have in 45 minutes, we're going to have three presentations like that. And we're going to have an iterative process because I want the presentation to be effective. It's going to be like, for me, it's like, it's like I want it to be very similar to how I will present this paper or, you know, not, how, not necessarily I, but I want it to be an effective learning experience for the rest of the class as well. So it will be an iterative process. First, you meet with Yeshaya, the TA of the course. He is uh, he's doing his master's degree in my lab. He took this course last semester and he's working with me. Uh, this is the second year that he's working with me. So he knows the course. He, I told him, don't read the papers. Don't read the papers. You're not supposed to read the papers. You're supposed to, to understand from the, from the, you're presenting to him so he can follow, right? He's going to give you some insights that he's a little more experienced in the field and he's going to be an unbiased observer, right? To give you some feedback. Uh, and, and, you know, and he's still, you know, he's still in the early stage of his career. He's not, uh, I'm, I have 10 years uh, full. I have a 10 years advantage over him. So I'm a little more experienced in what is important, what is less important. Uh, so, so don't take, what he says is trying to help you, but sometimes he's supposed to be here. He's not here yet, but uh, anyway, I'm not, uh, we talked about it. I mean, he will tell you your, his opinion. It's not necessarily that if you, if you feel differently, it's fine. Also, if you feel differently than me, it's fine, right? Then you'll go through me. You'll, you'll improve your presentation. You'll present it to me and we'll have a, another discussion. Each of these discussions is going to be like half an hour. And then you are ready to, based on improvements again, you are ready to have your presentation to class. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to grade you for the whole process. It doesn't mean that it needs to be per perfect from the beginning. It's need, I want to see that there is a, a trajectory here of a, an improvement on in, in improving the presentation. At the end, it should be a good presentation, right? It should be a good presentation. Class should be able to follow. The rest of the students should be able to follow, et cetera. Uh, so after class, and I'm not sure if today, but I'll, I'll share the Yeshaya's email and you pick a paper and I'll, I'll, I'll show the list of the papers as soon and, and, and you set the time. In terms of timing, uh, if you want the next timing, so I'm going to, uh, what I did now, I just uh, put papers that are related to deep learning in microscopy and part of it, also not everything. Uh, and so if you want to present in two weeks, you can start doing that based on what I teach you. Pick papers that relate to that and, 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 and it will be a good timing for that. And we'll have one hour, like three slots for that. So it's fine. And through the through the the time, we're going to have more and more uh, more and more uh, topics that you can pick from. If you want to do it toward the end of the semester, fine. You're going to have different topics to pick from. Um, I, I will ask you to. I, I, I'm also. I have some uh, missionary plan here with my course. It's the first course in the world that deals with this topic. I want to make everything as much as possible public. So unless you have a very strong objective, you're very afraid of, I don't know, people will know your name or something, uh, I would ask to, to publish the slides that you prefer and make them public for the community. Uh, ah, 20% I, I wrote that already. Okay, I don't know why I have this twice. Okay, a few tips. Most of the papers are long. I, I think about the, the, the care paper, right? Think about how many things they did there, how much data from here and from there, and they checked that and that. It's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's big, massive papers. Uh, so you need, you need to prepare yourself mentally for that. It's a hard read. And the biology is not helping either, right? We are computer scientists. We don't know biology, but the terms are confusing. Uh, so, so this is going to be a big challenge. And what I can tell you as, you know, as uh, advice is try to, to, try to ignore the spe a name of a molecule is important, right? But you can refer to it as X, as X, right? You don't need to, and, and, and what you need to be uh, careful about is not going into loopholes. So you see a term, you go to Wikipedia or Google it, and then you read about it. And then you see another term and you start reading about that. And then you're not, never going to, to finish reading your paper this way. You need to 
and this is also a good uh, practice for perfectionist people, you're not going to understand everything. You read, you understand the main message as in the context of this course in order to present it to the course. You saw, I, I told you uh, in the care paper, I told you, I don't remember which, but one of the model system, I, I, don't, I, I forgot what animal it was, right? I didn't remember if it's a slime mold or a, or a, or a, or a worm or a fish or whatever, I don't care. Or if a molecule, I do care, I should care in some context, but we shouldn't care in terms of, of this, uh, of, of, of what we want to achieve in this course. Uh, focus what is important in, when you present. The, what is the idea? Why is this paper cool? Why did I select it for you? And why, what are you going, what is the method? Well, how in two sentences you can summarize it and say why it is important. What was the methodology that was used that we care about? If there is an interesting network that you want to describe to class or is there is a, if there is an important methodology, methodological concept that they, they tackle, great. What are the main results? Why is it important? And what are the limitations? If you see a method, there are limitations. Every method have limitations. What, they, what, what, what are they? Uh, okay. Presentation structure. I'm not going to, to turn your head and make, uh, make five slides. Slide, slide number one is that, and slide number two is that. No, do whatever you'd like. But this is my advice in terms of structure, background and context in relation to what we learn in class. So basically this gives motivation. What is this about? Is it about uh, uh, image reconstruction, image enhancement? Is it about in silico labeling, what I just showed you now? Is it about, right, what, 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 how to connect it to what we learn in class? Why is it cool and important? What are the main contribution to the field and what are the, the cool results that you must show? So highlight specific results. What are the cool ideas uh, that, that were uh, demonstrated here? And then feel free to trash the, the paper. What is wrong here? What, is, what did they do? What, and there is a lot to say in all these papers, even the good papers, there is a lot that is not, is not done uh, that, that you can't come with critique. So what are the weaknesses of the paper? What are the limitations of the technique? The limitations are usually discussed in the paper. And then again, if you have a personal opinion, it's always good. What caught your attention? Even if it's not the main message of the paper, I, I like these results because I was concerned by this because, okay? So this is uh, what I'm expecting from you in terms of uh, preparation. And, uh, no, no, no. Where is it? No. Oh man. Where is the list of papers that I created? Okay. One second offline. I'll, maybe you can send it to me. I thought that I had it open. Ah, here. No. Something about chat. Okay. Okay, so here I wrote what I, you know, what I had in these the slides. And here I'm trying, I'll try to be consistent with that, right? I mean, uh, I'll try to write here the main papers that are relevant for each class. So here, deep learning in microscopy. This is the reviews that I suggested that you'll read. And these are the, this is the care content aware. And this is the Anna Palm papers that I presented. And these are the two papers that I, I, I presented the more, I didn't finish yet, but this is the paper that I started presenting now. And this is the other paper that I'll present, uh, uh, start presenting next week. And now here are the list of, uh, of papers that you can select from. Deep learning microscopy, so enhancing cell image quality. It's like, um, like, like care, like the, the content aware image restoration. And you can see here a bunch of images. Uh, for example, here, the, the last one, deep learning based point scan super, super resolution is, I know, uh, yeah. The deep, the deep storm 3D, for example, 
is a paper from the lab of Yoav uh, Shechman, who is at the biomedical engineering at the Technion. Uh, just, you know, some Israeli pride in that. Uh, here is the noising um, follow-up studies from Florian Jag, who, who was involved in the care. So cool ideas about reducing noise in images, in microscopy images. If you pick from here, these are shorter papers and more technical oriented, you'll need to pick two. The ideas are very simple and straightforward. I mean, they're cool, but simple. Segmentation, I'm, I'm probably going to describe some of this uh, next week, but I'm going to show on the Sama's leg. Uh, you can pick papers on that. Uh, data augmentation, in silico labeling is what I start showing you now, generating fake images of uh, localization of different molecules. So this is a paper uh, on, on uh, measurements for, uh, for uh, accuracy, right? And I'm going to talk about it also next week, about what is a, a good measurement, a practical measurement for, for, for in silico images that were ge uh, generated in silico images. And then you have uh, the, uh, a bunch of other images. And these are more classic uh, uh, papers about generative most, uh, me methods in the terms of uh, cell structure. Uh, the, the um, uh, halut, uh, how do you say? Um, no? Pioneer. The what? Pioneer. Pioneer, pioneer, yeah. Pioneer in that is uh, Bob Murphy from Carnegie Mellon. So these papers are not deep learning, but they are learning statistical start of different structures within the cell. So you can pick from there. And that's it for now, because I'm going to add more as we go on the different topics. Questions, comments? I have a question. In the iteration with the TA, uh, will we present him the presentation and then he tell us uh, what good that's bad or something more general? Yeah, yeah, you, you'll, you'll prepare a presentation, you'll present it and you'll get some feedback. And again, it's not, uh, Anatoly, for example, some things you are much more uh, mature than Yeshaya, right? I mean, you are toward the end of your PhD and you have a lot more experience in, uh, in, in, in a lot of things that Yeshaya don't. I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Also me, I'm going also to tell you things you might uh, disagree and it's fine, it's your presentation. Uh, Alina, your probably knowledge of biology is much better than mine, right? So if I tell you something, it doesn't mean that maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Also here, if, if I present something in, the, in class and, and, and I do mistakes in the biology or in the machine learning, or whatever, please. Uh, okay, so More questions. Uh, can you put some uh, uh... Uh, spreadsheet that uh, that uh, two teams uh, will not pick the same paper or something like that. Yeah, so that Yeshaya will do. I wanted first to talk to you, okay. and uh, then he'll prepare something. And I don't know if he wants through his email or through a spreadsheet or whatever, and uh, whatever mechanism he, he wants. Uh -huh. But it's it, it, I mean there are plenty of papers. There, there are much more papers than than a presentation. Yeah. Uh, so, so please, if you want to present in two weeks, please hurry with that. If we have three volunteers, then uh, I'll take one one hour from next week, from not next week, next class, and and we'll do that. And if not, it's fine as well. I mean, Tov, toda lekulam. Yes, Lisha, la klalita. I see. Okay, I'm speaking English. A general question. The, the, do you find the, the classes uh, too slow, too fast, too what? I mean, please give me feedback on how, it, how it's going. My, my wife uh, heard, uh, uh, heard me and she said I'm too, uh, I'm repeating, you know, I'm, I'm too repetitive and I'm too, I can't find the words, so I'm a uh, megam game. But, but that's, you know, that I cannot control. English is not, uh, you know, I'm learning English right now as well. So, uh, <laughs> For me, so that's, for that, me, that I cannot control. But, but anything else? For me, it's not too slow and not, not too fast. It's 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 okay. It's okay as well. I think it's okay. 
We all say it's okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. If you feel that it's too slow on, or too fast, please push me or hold me back. Okay. I mean, it's it's for you. I don't have any any specific. I have a syllabus. I I want to go through things, but if I don't go through them, no one is going to kill me for that, right? I think your wife is too critic. Here's a result from the web. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll cut this piece of uh, video and I'll uh, send it to her. So that. <laughs> <laughs> but when you listen to yourself in a video, it always sounds like weird, and especially when you don't prepare for a for a presentation. And in English, it's always harder because I don't find I can't find the words uh, easily. But this is also I'll tell you. This is one thing that I learned uh, very early and decided very early in my academic career that I don't care if I don't know English. I care that I want to convey a message. So if I'm a gamgam, right? If I'm a homeboy film gamgam in English, and you know that, it's fine. If I'm if I can find the words, it's fine as long as I can convey the message. Stuttering. So so I think it's also an important tip uh, for uh, and again. One of the key messages in, in life, I think, and I'm telling that all the time to the students who work with me, you can't be a, per, a perfectionist, right? I mean, perfectionists perfectionist suffer. So if you just speak and you don't care if you get the words wrong, but you still get the message right, it's better than uh, not speaking or, or waiting until you find each word uh, to perfectly fit, fit your sentence. Rebeni Mauptim Itzot, שיהיה לנו happy יום עצמאות, קורונה לס יום עצמאות, Independence Day, and I'll see you guys in two weeks. See you, goodbye. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you. Bye. 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 B
and together it builds the cell and together it gives us the, the, the many functions that cells can do. And this is the holy grail. This is the big question in the field. Can we understand that? Can we learn that and can we? And one of the main limitations is that we cannot see that in, in, in real microscopy. Why? Because each time we can tag one molecule, two molecules, three molecules, right? I mean, look at the images that I showed you before. You can, you can see just one color or two colors or three colors. So we cannot get an integrated picture of a cell by tagging fluorescent molecules to each of the specific organelles. Organelles is like organs, ebronim, it's like evarim shelata, right? And from that understand the complexity of its organization within it and how it correlates to the function of the cell. And it's a technical limitation because the molecular heart biology is difficult, trying to tag all of these uh, fluorescent molecules to each of the cells. And then also the optics is different because you image your cells and there are the wavelengths that are interfering with one another and then you need to computationally, computationally resolve them. So it's really a huge limitation and the world record, like the nicest papers that came out, they talked about, and, and there is now, usually the, the field was because of that, because of the technical uh, uh, limitation, most of the field was working molecule by organelle by organelle. So you tag an organelle, you try to understand something about your or this organelle, and then you move to the next organelle. And in the last few years, there is a whole field that is opening up in cell biology, which is uh, talked about, talking about organelle organelle communication or organelle organelle uh, um, interaction, right? How they are interacting with one another, these different organelles. But again, the technical limitation of imaging multiple multiple organelles at once, this is the rate limiting step. And uh, the nicest paper came out in, uh, I think 2017 or 18, maybe I'll show you next, uh, next, next time some videos and some data from there. It's a cell biological paper. The computational aspects are simple, but uh, it was like a, it was like a show off that they could image six different organelles in the same cell. But again, it was the one best lab in the world to do this, that can do these things. And it took the, the postdoc that did it like five years. So five years, what they reached is the ability to brag and, and, and come with some, some biological insight, but to brag that they can image six different organelles in the same cell and look at their interaction. So this is a huge limitation. Now, one of the, there is a lot of uh, efforts today to try to tackle that. And if you see, and a lot of it is actually philanthropic efforts. So, what I'm going to show you now is the Ellen Institute of Cell Science, which our Ellen is Paul Ellen is the um, is the founder of uh, one of the co the co-founder of Microsoft, and he he opened multiple institutes for science. He decided what are the most important scientific questions and domains that uh, needs to be solved, and he poured money there. So one was the brain science, Ellen Institute for Brain Science. It's uh, it's there for over ten years now, I think. And then there is a, there is Ellen Institute now for machine learning. It's all in Seattle, right? I mean, Microsoft. Ellen Institute for machine learning. There is Ellen Institute for cell science, which is what I'm talking on here. And there is a, now an Ellen Institute for immunology. Marek Chisun. In cell science, the, 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 the goal, the mission, you can see it here. The mission is to create a dynamic multiscale visual model of cell organization, dynamics and activity that capture experimental observation, theory and prediction, uh, behavior, normal, pathological contexts, right? So there is a whole institute with, uh, well, and also many, many other labs with the goal to understand how a cell is organized internally. And I really like this institute. And actually, we are also working with them, kind of collaborating with them because they're really about, they're not like what an individual lab can do. You know, I can solve a problem and write a paper or something. I'm not an experimentalist, so experimental lab can generate some data and put it out, but they're working like a factor, but, but we need to publish papers, right? We need to get to some, we get some, uh, we get our funding and we need to use it in order for these papers. And they care less about it and more about actually making a, a impact to the whole field. So they have like a factory wide uh, setting where they have a farm of microscopes and they're generating cells with specific, uh, specific organelles tagged, fluorescently tagged is like the best uh, techniques available there. And they give the cells to anyone. So if you now want to take their cells, which are also cool cell system, but I'm not going to talk about it. And you want to image that in your lab, no problem. They'll send it to you. 
Uh, they use this form of microscopes. They, they are going to validate these cells much better than any individual lab does. Uh, does. Uh, they, are, they are imaging tons of uh, high quality 3D images of the cells under different conditions and different uh, organelles, uh, left fluorescent labels. So they are making huge amounts of, uh, of uh, microscopy data that is publicly available and is actually really, really, really quality. And you can actually use it to ask different, to develop tools, to ask questions. To, to, to visualize and just, you know, just stare at these images to, to gain some insight just from staring at them as they are developing computational tools and they are letting the field use. But I think the impact, I really, I'm, I'm a, a fan, right? And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really supporting what they do. They are not the only ones who do that. Now there is also an initiative in the Hen Zuckerberg initiative. Hen Zuckerberg is, uh, Zuckerberg is the Facebook guy, Mark Zuckerberg. Han Hen is the, her, his uh, wife, which is, and they came up with this institute that they said that they're going to solve all the diseases in the next, uh, I don't know, year, many years. Well, the, but, but, but what they do, they really, they really put uh, funds into technology development in these fields. And they have a biohub, they have a, like a, a research institute also that collaborates with the Bay Area universities, with the Stanford and uh, Berkeley and the uh, UCSF. And, so, so these are two initiatives that generate a, a, a lot of data, of imaging data. They generate uh, uh, computational tools. Uh, they generate and, and they, they drive the field forward. Ah, there is also another thing. There is a Genelia research company. Genelia is a, is a HHMI. It's, a, it's another philanthropic effort. It's a, that they that they are they have the best microscope builders in the world and the best microscope in the world you can you can actually go there in order to, to use their microscopes and take uh, images with their microscope uh, and uh, and uh, they looked for they they actually asked the, the community the whole biological community what are the big problem what is the big problem that we now should pour a quarter milliard dollars in the next uh, 10 years or something and eventually what they decided was, I can't remember the exact name, but cell in a physiological context. So how a cell in, not in a dish, but in a context of a tissue, of an animal, imaging that and understanding how it works. These are, so anyway, I'm talking and talking, but the, the idea is that these are super important questions. Everybody understands that these are the questions that needs to be tackled. And the philanthropic effort are actually giving here a really big boost in, in terms of what is really needed to solve that. And part of what they do, is generate huge and, and high quality data sets that were not available before uh, that allow computational uh, guys or girls, right, to, to actually to mine them and, and ask new questions and develop new tools, which is, I think it's huge and the impact is going to be huge. Now, currently, these data sets are, are mo there is not a lot of people who are actually playing with them. They're really raw. Which is again an opportunity. So we are playing with uh, the Ellen Institute data sets a lot, and with some other data sets in the lab. And uh, it's, it's pure gold. I mean, it's just you have there's so much you can extract so much information from this data, which is cool. So what you see here is uh, uh, what they do and all the contributions that they do. So they have uh, visualizations. You can uh, you can look the Ellen Cell Explorer. You can start and look at how cells look and how it is composed. Uh, they have, uh, they develop uh, cells that you can take with gene editing and they go do, do quality controls and, uh, and they develop uh, different assays and they do microscopy and blah, blah, blah. So they, it's really cool. And I included here a few links. I'm not going to go into that because of uh, time, but really, I mean, I really recommend you guys to just, you know, just, just the uh, Tailu. In, in their website, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, okay, so I told you that we cannot image many organelles in with the same living cell. There are other initiatives. I think I'll have a, I'll, I'll have a lesson on, about public data sets, et cetera, and, and then I'll go and I'll tell you which public data set, what, what each data set is and what is it good for and what is the, what, what, what can, yeah, what, what people can do with it, but not now. Because I just remember two other data sets that I didn't mention. And okay, uh, so the holy grail, if we can take a cell and reconstruct 
the localization of different organelles within it. Then we overcome all the technical difficulties and we can get an integrative image of the cell and start learning really in a living cell uh, all, the, all the interactions and all the relations between the different organelles. So if we can do that without, so without taking an image or without tagging our organelles, take a, a bright field image, just image yourself, and then use generative models to actually uh, predict where the different organelles are going to be localized. And then we're going to have an integrated image of the cell. If we have this technology, I mean, it's a Nobel Prize. Again, if we have it and if it, if it works, it's Nobel Prize, I mean, I'm recording, right? I need to be careful, but it's easily a Nobel Prize, I would say, because you know it's much, you, it's much more important than super resolution. Don't don't tell Natalie that I say that, but it's but it's it's you know it's 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 really groundbreaking. Okay, so now I build the the, the tension, right? So if if we can do that, the future of augmented microscopy would be that you can take uh, you know you can do data collection and then you can uh, take different uh, uh, combine it with different data sets and do model training and then have different questions on the same data sets and integrate everything together and get a holistic representation of the super complex biology that currently we can only look at it from one every time we look at it from one angle and we miss everything else so this would be really a revolution and this is where we're trying to go as a field okay but i didn't show you even if it's possible or nothing of course right so so this is the idea and these are the two seminal papers that I want to go over and uh, go, go through today. And there are other papers now, but again, these are the two that I, the first and the ones that I think are most, uh, uh, yeah, the, the ones that started the thing. And not this, yeah. yeah, there are some limitations there, but yeah, but I, I'll talk about it. But the idea is as follows. We take a bright field image. We use predictive models to generate different channels. So each channel is a different organelle. And now we can start in correlating the different organelles, try to understand how a cell is built and how, when a cell decides to do something, how its internal structure is, organization is changing. And when a disease occurs, when, when you get cancer, right? Not you, someone, I don't know, someone else gets cancer, what is different there in, in terms of the organization? And then maybe we can find drugs that reverse that. Just one example, right? I mean, to give motivation. So the idea is as follows. It's really hard to label fluorescently a lot of organelles, but we can do it with one organ. So what we can do here is each time, and we, we showed that the Ellen Institute did that, right? I mean, they have part of their data is this data, these cells, where each cell is labeled with a different organelle, a cell system with a different organelle label. So if we have now cells with one organ label and we can learn a mapping, so we can now train a generative model to map the bright field image to a reconstruction of the fluorescent target. So this is the input. Let me draw that. So this is the input. We learn a model to go from here to here. And the model is trained based on this is the ground truth, right? So this is the error is, is, is based on how well the reconstruction resembles the reconstruction here. Here, it's very similar to the care to the to the Anna Palm. Just the modality is different. It's not improving the resolution of an image, but it's predicting a different modality. It's predicting a different a different structure. And if we can do that, and it's a big if because. It's not necessarily that you can, uh, who says that the, the bright field image contain information regarding the molecular organization? I don't know. But if we can do that, then now we can train different models, each one trained on a separate data set of one organelle. And now we can take a bright field image with nothing uh, labeled within it and generate all these fake images, which will give us a, a holistic representation of the cell. It's amazing if it works. I'm going to show you now an example, which is uh, which, 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 which is uh, very, I think, uh, convincing. So this is this is the input. 
This is the only thing that is real here. The rest is fake. And whoever looks at these images, it looks real. I mean, it looks like real microscopy images. And, and what you see here, and it's really hard to see from the bright field images, is a cell undergoing mitosis, dividing. One cell becoming two cells. It, it's really hard to see here. I, we'll see it later. I'll, I, I will we'll pinpoint it here. But, 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 but when we use these generative models, right? From here, we generate all these images, sequences. We can see here the DNA that is splitting, right? Here it's one, but here it's already two. We can see, yeah. The input is the bright field and the tagged organelles, right? No. So I, I missed something. Okay, so I'll go one slide back. Two slides back. We have one organelle, okay? Each cell, cell system has one organelle tag label, fluorescently. Okay. So what we can learn is a model that can on take a bright field images, image and generate one organelle. This is the training. Okay. So what what is tagged? Here it's something a nuclear marker. I don't know what exactly DNA. So when it tagged, it's it, it, you produce a picture of it, no? Yeah, but yeah, but what we learn here is a generative model. The, the ground truth here is a, is a matched image of bright field and, uh, and the fluorescent image of the DNA. Okay, so in the input, you have two components. One is the bright field and the other is the tag. No, 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 no. Okay. no the, input, the input is a bright field image. You, 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 you build a network that needs to reconstruct the, the matching fluorescent target. So the network gets, so, okay, so experimentally, you image a bright field and the experimentally, uh, the, the, the fluorescent tagged image, okay? This is what you have from, the exp from one experiment, okay? Okay. Okay, but for the, for the machine learning, you take a bright field image and you learn a mapping, a gener gener generative, gen you know, a model that will generate, take a bright field image and we generate from it a fluorescent image, a corresponding fluorescent image. And you use the ground rules here to train the network. So how do you how do you build this model of the tag the image based on previous knowledge of previous pictures, right? So this is this is what okay, so I'll, this is what we get from an experiment, okay? But this is just just the training. So we have training and we have next we use what we are going to train, okay? We have this as training. This is a model, a deep learning net, network, okay? I'll mm -hmm. show you, I mean, it could, could be anything, but I'm going to show you networks, of course, which takes as input a, just a bright field and it goes through the networks and it generates a prediction of the fluorescent target. When we train this network, we back propagate the errors based on the discrepancy from the prediction to the fluorescent target. How can you predict if, if you never seen the localization of the tag, the organism? You could ask the same question. If you understood it for the content aware image restoration, it's the same thing. Basically, how can you predict something new from something that the information, you know, you learn a mapping from one to the second. If, if the mapping doesn't exist, if I'm going, if this is going to be crap, this is going to be junk, we're not going to learn any real mapping. So it start, if you look at it, we start with the mapping that is bad, but it, 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 through iteratively, the model is optimized and it improves by optimizing, by reducing, minimizing the discrepancy between the prediction and the ground truth image. Okay. Okay, think about it. Uh, maybe you need a little more time, but but uh, but now when you have it, you can you can you have a, a network that gets a bright field image and can map it into a fluorescent image. And now we can do something like this because we have for each organelle we have a different model that we trained independently. And now we take an image, a bright field image, and we use model one, model two, model three, etc. And for each model we generate. The localization of the organelle, but this image is not labeled with anything. Okay, 
It just that in the training, we learned this mapping from a bright field to, to the localization of each molecule. And now once we have it, here is an example. And here, what you can see here is a dividing cell, right? So you can see the DNA splitting from one to two. You can see here, you don't, here you don't see a, a membrane going between the cell, et cetera. You can see very clearly a cell dividing. And now when we know that and we look here, we can actually see, I mean, here are the two cells, but it's really hard, I mean. And what it means, well, the ability to do that, and this is what you, the ability to do this mapping from a bright field to a fluorescent image, it means that the bright field images contain implicit hidden information that allows us to do this transformation. So the texture of the image with, within the bright field contains the information that allows this reconstruction where, every, where the, the, the organism within the cell is located. It's pretty amazing. Question. Uh, I have a question. So you said uh, this is the Holy Grail and this is a Nobel Prize if one can achieve this, but it seems like they achieved it, so. Yeah, but, but I said also if it works. So it, it doesn't work? It works, you know, but it has a lot of limitations. It works mm -hmm. in very specific conditions. And here, when I say, when I, when I stress that uh, on the hallucination effects, right? Here, mm -hmm. hallucination would be, would kill you. Because if you want to understand, uh, if you want to understand where, where organelles are touching each, each other, but you cannot trust the localization of your organelles, it's not anymore just a general similarity of images. You want to really know that what you get is, is right, right? And if you get false organelles, then it's a problem because you cannot learn any biology out of it. And if you perturb yourself, if you do now a perturb, if you put some drug on yourself and something within yourself change, can you trust? Even if, if, even if your control cells are, 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 you learn the model, can you trust uh, uh, if you want to learn what the perturbation did, what the treatment did, can you trust it or not? It's, it's a question. I mean, we'll go through it and we'll see some data and we'll, it's, but it's an open question. And, you know, we are far away from this Nobel Prize that I'm saying now, no one is going to trust the biology that you can get out of it. But it's still, first, it's very impressive, even just to show that the information is hidden there. And you'll see that you can learn some things about that. You can get some insight about that. And it's, you know, it's a field that is just, uh, it's emerging. There was a paper that came out uh, last week, a preprint that came out last week that I, I was, uh, I, I might still include in the course. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I want or not, and you can pick it also, but I'll, uh, it, it actually shows some nice, uh, Science applications of that, and and in in and in the lab in in my lab we also were trying to work on on these aspects as well. But in this uh, in this example, uh, you have a quantitative measure that you can say how well it works because you have the fluorescent of these bright field images, right? In this case, we do not have. Uh, well, at least they say that they don't have. Uh, they don't show it. They show just the bright field and the fluorescent channel. But yeah, you could in principle a label now DNA and, and show that, you know, that it's true, that the timing of the division is captured properly. And then you can say, okay, if I want, and you do it on a lot of data. And then you say, okay, if what I care about is the timing of division, timing, I want to, uh, to detect the division, I can use this in silico, in silico is in the computer, right? In mm -hmm. silico labeling, it's called, uh, they call it uh, in silico labeling uh, or synthetic cell, or I don't know what, uh, you, you can uh, you can actually I, oh, okay. uh, yeah. so you can de develop now quantitative measure proves that it's good for this application and use it right people don't do it yet exactly but next week we'll we'll hear a little more about that Okay, so the architecture is just a unit, it's the same thing. And, uh, and here you can see some uh, examples and you can see here, this is the input, this is the target, this is what you want to do, and this is the prediction. Notice that it's not only that we get a nice prediction of the localization, actually it's look even nicer, the prediction looks nicer 
than the than the ground truth image. Why is that? Why do you think the prediction? Why it's less grained? Yeah. The contrast is bigger in the prediction. No, it uh, removes the stochastic noise, maybe. Exactly. Think about it. As a model, we're trying to capture structure within our data. Noise has no structure, right? It's, it's assuming that it's random noise. Most of what we see here in the background is just random, right? Background noise. So the network cannot learn that, which actually comes to our advantage because now we can generate nicer images, which are even better for post processing, right? So in, 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 uh, in that case, yeah. Uh, and again, if we talk about similarity measured, we don't really care about correlation between the background pixel, for example, to the ground truth. We see, we see here that it's fine. And, 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 and defining better measurement for similarity based on some tasks that you want to achieve is a, could be a good product for this course. So you can do the prediction are in 3D, which is cool. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and nicely, they have a, a, lot, a, a library of many structures. So this is just from their a cell catalog. So you can buy these cells with, 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 the, with different organelle uh, tags within them. So you can have, take an image of them. So they have like, I think 19 different, no, they have even 30 or something now cell, cell, cell lines but they have 19 big data sets that you can play with. And uh, here are different, uh, you know, this is the target and this is the prediction. And you can see that the results are relatively good. Not always. Look at the tie junction, for example, at the bottom, almost at the bottom left here, you can see the tie junction, which is uh, the ground truth on the left is nice. And on the right, you get something much dimmer and less structured. And uh, they could quantify that. So what you see here, and here the similarity measure is just, just plain correlation. So pixel correlation, the intensity of a pixel, you correlate the prediction to the ground truth. And this is how well you are reconstructing your, your images. And you can see that some image, some structures and each, uh, each uh, name here is a structure. You can see that some structures are uh, reconstructed better than other structures. And the, the black uh, line here, is the theoretical maximal correlation. And it came actually, it, it, it was pretty cool how they did it. And they took the noise within their system, within this die. So each of these has a, has a different uh, fluorescent uh, marker, right? Each fluorescent marker has its own noise and background, uh, uh, background the intensities that are disturbing, right? The, the prediction. So what they did, they looked, they added the noise based on what they know on the ground truth image and they showed how well it can be reconstructed. And this gives an upper limit. So it shows how, what are our current uh, results, but how we can still uh, improve. Uh, and actually now in the lab, we replicated these results and we're moving on to, to ask different questions, which I'm, I'm going to tell you maybe, maybe next lesson. Next, next lesson is, is not next week, in, in two weeks. So I, I'm over my time and I think we should go to, ah, uh, we should go to the papers. I also prepared a few slides for that. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so pick a paper and schedule yourself for class presentation. And this, this is 20% of your grade in the course. A presentation is in pairs. If someone wants uh, to be alone, then fine. But the pairs is a more technical restriction because I just want to be, I want it to be effective, right? I don't want it to, I want to teach you other things, right? I want to, to have time to teach you myself and not spend all the too many, too many weeks on, uh, on student presentations. I distributed the list of uh, papers. There is a reason why these papers are there. If you want a specific paper, you know, you really want and you really feel uh, strongly about it and tell me and convince me and fine, I'll be, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you no, probably, but you need to really, you need to really work hard to convince me. 
And the, the list I picked are important papers that I think from the field and the newish papers I think are either important, interesting, or ones that I didn't have a chance to read or explore yet. So I said, okay, this is an opportunity. So we might get a few that are not great, but you know, but uh, but the idea is uh, to 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 do a literature survey in this uh, course. Uh, last, uh, so this is the second round of the course. The, in the first round, I did it. I didn't limit in time, and it was more like, okay, you take a paper and you come back and you present, and this is all. It didn't work well. First, because students uh, spent a lot of time presenting their papers. Each paper was like half an hour. Now, I, I now spent more than half an hour on care or in the Anna Palm, but it had a specific, I could present it also in two minutes. I had a specific purpose to teach you the general ideas. And these are like the milestone papers on the field. I think these are the, the they had all these cool ideas that I wanted to highlight, but there is no reason to do that. I mean, if we see now again, the same, a very similar paper on a different domain, you just need to say, this is the domain, this is, you know, just, just say what is cool specifically about this paper. You don't need to give an overlay, an overview of the whole of everything. So it didn't work well because it took too much of the course. And because students didn't know how to pinpoint. So it was not effective. I mean, one student was presenting and the other class was kind of uh, sleeping and I was talking with them. It was very little interaction and it wasn't really good learning. I think it wasn't, wasn't effective learning. So uh, I decided to change the structure. First, limiting the time. So each presentation is going to be 10 minutes plus five minutes for discussion. That's all. In 10 minutes, you need to convey the the highlight of your paper, the highlights, why it is important, the highlight results, etc. of the paper, plus five minutes for discussion. I'm going to be very strict about this timing. So we're going to have in 45 minutes, we're going to have three presentations like that. And we're going to have an iterative process because I want the presentation to be effective. It's going to be like, for me, it's like, it's like I want it to be very similar to how I will present this paper or, you know, not, how, not necessarily I, but, I want it to be an effective learning experience for the rest of the class as well. So it will be an iterative process. First, you meet with Yeshaya, the TA of the course. He is uh, he's doing his master's degree in my lab. He took this course last semester and he's working with me. Uh, this is the second year that he's working with me. So he knows the course. He, I told him, don't read the papers. Don't read the papers. You're not supposed to read the papers. You're supposed to, to understand from the, from the, you're presenting to him so he can follow, right? He's going to give you some insights that he's a little more experienced in the field and he's going to be an unbiased observer, right? To give you some feedback. Uh, and, and, you know, and he's still, you know, he's still in the early stage of his career. He's not, uh, I'm, I have 10 years, uh, so I have a 10 years advantage over him. So I'm a little more experienced in what is important, what's less is important. Uh, so, so don't take, what he says is trying to help you, but sometimes, He's supposed to be here, he's not here yet. But uh, anyway, I'm not, uh, we talked about it. I mean, he will tell you your, his opinion. It's not necessarily that if you, if you feel differently, it's fine. Also, if you feel differently than me, it's fine, right? Then you'll go through me, you'll, you'll improve your presentation, you'll present it to me, and we'll have a, another discussion. Each of these discussions is going to be like half an hour. And then you are ready to, based on improvements again, you are ready to have your presentation to class. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to grade you for the whole process. It doesn't mean that it needs to be per perfect from the beginning. It's need, I want to see that there is a, a trajectory here of a, an improvement on in, in improving the presentation. At the end, it should be a good presentation, right? It should be a good presentation. Class should be able to follow. The rest of the students should be able to follow, etc. cetera. Uh, so after class, and I'm not sure if today, but I'll, I'll share the Yeshaya's email and you pick a paper and I'll, I'll, I'll show the list of the papers as soon and, and, and you set the time. In terms of timing, uh, if you want the next timing, so I'm going to, uh, what I did now, I just uh, put papers that are related to deep learning in microscopy and part of it, also not everything. Uh, and so if you want to present in two weeks, you can start doing that based on what I teach you. Pick papers that relate to that and, 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 and it will be a good timing for that. And we'll have one hour, like three slots for that. So it's fine. And through the, through the, the time, we're going to have more and more, uh, more, and more uh, topics that you can pick from. If you want to do it toward the end of the semester, fine. You're going to have different topics to pick from.
Um, I, I will ask you to, I, I, I'm also, I have some uh, missionary plan here with my course. It's the first course in the world that deals with this topic. I want to make everything as much as possible public. So unless you have a very strong objective, you're very afraid of, I don't know, people will know your name or something. Uh, I would ask to, to publish the slide that you prefer and make them public for the community. Ah, 20% I, I wrote that already. Okay, I don't know why I have this. Why? Okay, a few tips. Most of the papers are long. I, I think about the, the, the care paper, right? Think about how many things they did there, how much data from here and from there, and they checked that and that. It's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's big, massive papers. Uh, so you need, you need to prepare yourself mentally for that. It's a hard read. And the biology is not helping either, right? We are computer scientists. We don't know biology, but the terms are confusing. Uh, so, so this is going to be a big challenge. And what I can tell you as you know, as uh, advice is try to to try to ignore the spe a name of a molecule is important, right? But you can refer to it as X, as X, right? You don't need to. And, and, and what you need to be uh, careful about is not going into loopholes. So you see a term, you go to Wikipedia or Google it, and then you read about it. And then you see another term and you start reading about that. And then you're not never going to, to finish reading your paper this way. You need to, and this is also a good uh, practice for perfectionist people, you're not going to understand everything. You read, you understand the main message as in the context of this course in order to present it to the course. You saw, I, I told you, in the care paper, I told you, I don't remember which, but one of the model system, I, I, don't, I, I forgot what animal it was, right? I didn't remember if it's a slime mold or a, or, a, or, a, or a worm or a fish or whatever, I don't care. Or if a molecule, I do care, I should care in some context, but we shouldn't care in terms of, of this, uh, of, of, of what we want to achieve in this course. Uh, focus what is important when you present. What is the idea? Why is this paper cool? Why did I select it for you? And why? What are you going? What is the method? Well, how in two sentences you can summarize it and say why it is important? What was the methodology that was used that we care about? If there is an interesting network that you want to describe to class, or if there is a, if there is an important methodology, methodological concept that they, they tackle, great. What are the main results? Why is it important? And what are the limitations? If you see a method, there are limitations. Every method have limitations. What they, what, what, what are they? Uh, okay. Presentation structure. I'm not going to to turn your head and make uh, make five slides. Slide slide number one is that, and slide number two is that. No, do whatever you'd like. But this is my advice in terms of structure, background, and context in relation to what we learn in class. So basically, this gives motivation. What is this about? Is it about uh, uh, image reconstruction, image enhancement? Is it about in silico labeling, what I just showed you now? Is it about right? What, 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 how to connect it to what we learn in class? Why is it cool and important? What are the main contribution to the field, and what are the, the cool results that you must show? So highlight specific results. What are the cool ideas? Uh, that, that were uh, demonstrated here. And then feel free to trash the, the paper. What is wrong here? What, is, what did they do? What, and there is a lot to say in all these papers, even the good papers, there is a lot that is not, is not done uh, that, that you can come with critique. So what are the weaknesses of the paper? What are the limitations of the technique? The limitations are usually discussed in the paper. And then again, if you have a personal opinion, it's always good. What caught your attention? Even if it's not the main message of the paper, I, I like these results because I was concerned by this because, okay? So this is uh, what I'm expecting from you in terms of uh, preparation. And, uh, no, 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 where is it? No, oh man. 
with the list of papers that I created. Okay, one second offline. I'll, maybe you can send it to me. I thought that I had it open. Ah, uh, here. No. Santi Bachet. Okay. okay, so here I wrote what I, you know, what I had in these, these slides. And here I'm trying, I'll try to be consistent with that, right? I mean, uh, I'll try to write here the main papers that are relevant for each class. So here, deep learning in microscopy. This is the review that I suggested that you read. And these are the, this is the care content aware, and this is the Anna Palm papers that I presented. And these are the two papers that I, I, I presented the more, I didn't finish yet, but this is the paper that I started presenting now. And this is the other paper that I'll present, uh, uh, start presenting next week. And now here are the list of, uh, of papers that you can select from. Deep learning microscopy, so enhancing cell image quality, it's like, um, like like care, like the the content aware image restoration, and you can see here a bunch of images. Uh, for example, here the the last one, deep learning based point scan super super resolution, is I know, uh, yeah, the deep the deep storm 3D, for example, is a paper from the lab of uh, Yoav Shechtman, who is the, the biomedical engineering at the Technion. Uh, just you know, some Israeli pride in that. Uh, here is the noising um, follow-up studies from Florian Jag, who, who was involved in the care. So cool ideas about reducing noise in images, in microscopy images. If you pick from here, these are shorter papers and more technical oriented, you'll need to pick two. The ideas are very simple and straightforward. I mean, they're cool, but simple. Segmentation, I'm, I'm probably going to describe some of this uh, next week, but I'm going to show on the Sama's leg, uh, you can pick papers on that. Uh, data augmentation, in silico labeling is what I start showing you now, generating fake images of uh, localization of different molecules. So this is a paper uh, on, on uh, measurements for, uh, for uh, accuracy, right? And I'm going to talk about it also next week, about what is a, a good measurement, a practical measurement for, for, for in silico images that were ge uh, generated in silico images. And then you have uh, the, uh, a bunch of other images. And these are more classic uh, uh, papers about generative most, uh, me methods in the terms of uh, cell structure. Uh, the the um, uh, halut, uh, how do you say? Um, no? Pioneer. The what? Pioneer. Pioneer, 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 yeah. Pioneer in that is uh, Bob Murphy from Carnegie Mellon. So these papers are not deep learning, but they are learning statistical struct of different structures within the cell. So you can pick from there. And that's it for now, because I'm going to add more as we go on the different topics. Questions, comments? I have a question. In the iteration with the TA, uh, will we present him the presentation and then he tell us uh, what good that's bad or something more general? Yeah, yeah, you, you'll, you'll prepare a presentation, you'll present it and you'll get some feedback. And again, it's not uh, Anatoly, for example, some things you are much more uh, mature than Yeshaya, right? I mean, you are toward the end of your PhD and you have a lot more experience in, uh, in, in, in a lot of things that Yeshaya don't. I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Also me, I'm going also to tell you things you might uh, disagree and it's fine, it's your presentation. Uh, Alina, your probably knowledge of biology is much better than mine, right? So if I tell you something, it doesn't mean that maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Also here, if, if I present something in, the, in class and, and, and I do mistakes in the biology or in the machine learning, or whatever, please, the giduli, hello? More questions. Uh, can you put some uh, uh, 
spreadsheet that uh, that uh, t two teams will not pick the same paper or something like that? Yeah, so that Yeshaya will do. I wanted first to talk to you okay. and uh, then he'll prepare something. And I don't know if he wants through his email or through a spreadsheet or whatever and uh, whatever mechanism he, he wants. Uh -huh. But it, it's, it, I mean, there are plenty of papers. There are much more papers than than the presentation. Yeah. Uh, so, so please, if you want to present in two weeks, please hurry with that. If we have three volunteers, and uh, I'll take one one hour from next week, from not next week, next class, and and we'll do that. And if not, it's fine as well. I mean. Tov, toda lekulam. יש לי שאלה כללית. אוקיי, אני מדבר באנגלית. A general question. The, the, do you find the, the classes uh, too slow, too fast, too what? I mean, please give me feedback on how, it, how it's going. My, my wife uh, heard, uh, uh, heard me and she said I'm too, uh, I'm repeating, you know, I'm, I'm too repetitive and I'm too, I can't find the words, so I'm a uh, megamgam. But, but that's, you know, that I cannot control. English is not, uh, you know, I'm learning English right now as well. So, uh, <laughs> for me, so that, for that, me, that I cannot control, but, but anything else? For me, it's not too slow and not, not too fast. It's, it's, it's okay. It's okay, okay as well. Okay. I think it's okay. We all say it's okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. If you feel that it's too slow or too fast, please push me or hold me back, okay? I mean, it's, it's for you. I don't have any, any specific, I have a syllabus. I, I want to go through things, but if I don't go through them, no one is going to kill me for that, right? I think your wife is too critic. Here's a result from the web. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll cut this piece of uh, video and I'll uh, send it to her, so that. <laughs> <laughs> but when you listen to yourself in a video it always sounds like weird and especially when you don't prepare for a for a presentation and in english it's always harder because i don't find i can't find the words uh, easily but this is also i'll tell you this is one thing that i learned uh, very early and decided very early in my academic career that i don't care if i don't know english i care that i want to convey a message so if i make a game right if i'm it's fine if I'm if I can't find the words. It's fine as long as I can convey the message. So so I think it's also an important tip uh, for uh, and again one of the key messages in in life I think and I'm telling that all the time to the students who work with me. You can't be a, per, a perfectionist, right? I mean, perfectionist perfectionist suffer. So if you just speak and you don't care if you get the words wrong, but you still get the message right. It's better than uh, not speaking or, or waiting until you find each word uh, to perfectly fit, fit your sentence. Do any more optimizot? Shiela no happy Yom Atzmaut. The Corona less Yom Atzmaut, Independence Day, and uh, I'll see you guys in uh, two weeks. See you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.